Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Keith Powers. I am the chair of the Committee on Criminal Justice. Um, we actually, before we get to the testimony, we have to do a quick vote in our committee on two bills that are from a uh, previous hearing that we had, uh, I think, two months ago. Um, as part of, so to start, we're going to be voting on two bills today. The first is Intro 933, which is introduced by Majority Leader Cumbo, which requires the Department of Correction to report on incidents of sexual abuse and harassment to our incarcerated individuals in city jails. The second is proposed Intro 1090 by Councilmember Drom, which will require the Department of Correction to report an incidents of sexual abuse, harassment, and force to visitors in city jails. These bills were heard on September 6, 2018, in a hearing that we had with the women and justice systems on sexual abuse in jails. And I want to thank both of those chairs and those committees for joining us. Um, in the past few years, we've seen uh, victim advocates, the Department of Justice, Board of Correction, and media speak publicly and report on the culture of abuse in the New York City jails. According to the September 2018 report from the Board of Corrections, between 2016 and 2017, the number of sexual abuse and harassment complaints by people in custody increased by 40% from 823 to 1151. It's not just incarcerated individuals who are being abused. As of November 2017, over 45 women filed or were in the process of filing lawsuits that accused the DOC of unlawful strip searches. That being said, uh, we are uh, very proud of the work we did to do oversight on these uh, issues and, also, of course, thankful for the members for putting forward bills that will help us have a better understanding of what is happening when we have somebody in custody or they are visiting a loved one. Um, I, I believe we may be joined by Majority Leader Cumbo, who wants to say a few words about her bill, and we'll offer that opportunity when she gets here. Um, we're going to call a roll on that vote, and I think we'll leave it open. We have two more members here um, from the committee that have to join us, so we'll leave it open for them as well. So I'm going to ask the clerk on, to call the roll on those bills. William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote, Committee on Criminal Justice. Items are coupled. Chair Powers. I vote aye. Lansman. Aye. Holden. Aye. I vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Both items have been adopted by the committee. Good. We'll leave it open. Thanks. Okay, now to the issue at hand. Um, so good afternoon. Once again, I am still Keith Powers, the <laughs> chair of the Criminal Justice Committee. Um, I, I want to uh, thank, and we're joined by Councilmember Van Bramer, who is the chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. I want to thank him because of early on when I took over the chair as this, and he's been, I don't know, 12 years on the, as the chair. Uh, we, no, oh, no. We, uh, we have, well, 12 maybe. Um, uh, we, uh, we, had, we had talked about working together on um, some specific overlap, and he was, um, he was, uh, uh, had a couple ideas, and this is one of them. So um, with that being said, an independent report came out last Tuesday on Neon Arts, a program of the New York City Department of Probation in partnership with Cartney Calls Music Institute, which integrates arts programming into seven neighborhood opportunity networks across the city. The report was clear that the programs have clear benefits. The study showed that NEON had succeeded in identifying untapped talents, building relationships, and increasing participant confidence in expressing thoughts and emotions. Further, engaging in programs such as NEON assists with developing social and critical thinking skills. I commend the Department of Probation for providing a means of expression for its participants and look forward today to hearing more about the lessons we can learn from the program's success. I also look forward to hearing more about the work of the Public Artists in, in Residence or PAIR program at the DOP and how we can encourage more folks to participate in NEON programs. I want to thank uh, my staff for uh, helping me put together this hearing and the department and Carnegie Hall for being here to testify as well as many others. I want to note that we were joined on my committee by uh, Councilmember Lansman, who's also the chair of the uh, Justice Systems uh, uh, Committee. We're also joined by Councilmember Holden from the Great Borough of Queens and the Great Neighborhood of Mill Village. And, uh, and now we will hear from another member of Queens and the chair, uh, Jimmy Van Bramer. Thank you. First of all, let me just say, Every committee hearing should begin with praise of the Great Borough of Queens and its neighborhoods. So I want to applaud my co-chair, uh, Chair and Council Member Powers for recognizing the greatness of the Borough of Queens. And, 
the greatness of Middle Village and all of our neighborhoods. Um, so it's great to be here. It's great to be the chair uh, of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. And uh, part of the work that we do is highlighting programs and, and scrutinizing things when they don't work, but it's also equally important to promote and highlight things that are working, that are making a difference in the lives of real New Yorkers. And this is one of those uh, uh, things. I was at a luncheon right before I came here and I was telling my seatmate about where I was going and the hearing and what it was about. And he asked me the question that I asked Commissioner Bermudez uh, a couple of weeks ago when I visited the Jamaica Neon Art Center, which is, uh, what is uh, the track record on reducing recidivism? And I said, you know, the data is, is still not uh, completely in on that. But he answered the question before I said it back to him when I said it's not just about recidivism. And he said, it's human. It's very human what this is about. And I said, that's exactly the point. That's exactly what this is about. Because uh, in a democratic society, uh, access to the arts is a fundamental human right. We should see it as such. The arts are for everyone. Uh, it builds confidence. It builds empathy. It educates and prepares people for future leadership opportunities, leadership opportunities that maybe they were denied in the past, but through experiencing the power of the arts and unleashing the power and the goodness within themselves, uh, we can change lives. Uh, we spend so much money on incarcerating people in our society. Uh, the city itself, 1.3 billion uh, per year. Wouldn't it be great if we spent an equal or greater amount of money on the arts and arts programming and arts and education um, and uh, certainly more programs like Neon Arts uh, and everyone is entitled uh, to experience uh, and practice the arts, and particularly those leaving uh, uh, our criminal justice system. We know that this is important, the skills that come with being an artist uh, and practicing uh, your art, however you uh, feel that, I know that it may not look like it, but Councilmember Powers and I are excellent dancers. <laughs> I don't even know if that's true. <laughs> um, I was just guessing, maybe. Um, but when I dance, I feel really good, and it's, it's great, and I bet you do too, Councilmember Powers. Um, but everybody should feel uh, uh, confident. Everybody should feel good. Everybody should... Um, uh, know that there is goodness and joy and power within them and that when they create and they share that with the rest of the world It not only enriches their own lives. It enriches everyone around them and uh, we know uh, That we have a long way to go in our society with simply Recognizing our own collective humanity and appreciating everybody else's um, so uh, I look forward to hearing more from those who are here uh, maybe some of those who are or have been in the program and benefited from it, maybe even seeing some art better than uh, the dancing of Chairman Powers. And, um, and I wanna say this, uh, Commissioner Bermudez, I said this last week, I say this every time, I am uh, so impressed with uh, your dedication to uh, all of your clients and your belief in this program. Carnegie Hall, I was uh, chatting you up at the, at the luncheon that I was just at and saying, you know, this is such a great program for so many reasons. Carnegie Hall is one of the most august of cultural institutions in the city of New York. And we know of their amazing programs and the historic performances that have taken place on their great stages. Uh, and sometimes it gets a bad rap, right, that it's, it's just for the elite and it's just an elitist institution. If they only knew, if people only knew around the work that Carnegie Hall is doing. Um, and the joy of going to Carnegie Hall um, for folks who maybe thought it'd be hard to ever see themselves getting 
uh, to Carnegie Hall. It's not just practice, 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 right? Uh, it is also uh, being a part of Neon Arts, um, and that's how you get to Carnegie Hall. Um, and that's powerful in and of itself, just to simply be there, right? To know that I am of this place, and I too uh, can take part in the joys and the wonders of all of this. So uh, anxious to hear more from everyone, um, but also to amplify what's going on here uh, and make sure that we're sharing uh, the good news and making sure that everyone else knows what's happening. So with that, thank you all for being here and thank you to my co-chair. I will have made no comment on my dancing skills. I'm a, more of an effort than a talent. Um, uh, so uh, with that being said, we're gonna, I think, swear all the folks in. I think Carnegie Hall, you don't have to technically swear in, but for the, from the administration as well. Uh, and then we'll offer you the opportunity to testify. Thank you. We've also been joined by uh, Councilmember Burley. If everyone could raise your right hand, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions. Yes, we do. Great, thank you. We'll start with the administration, and then we'll ask Carnegie Hall to go next. Thank you, and just if you might, don't mind stating your name and right. your title, thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, good morning, Chair Powers, Chair Von Bramer, and members of the Criminal Justice and Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations Committees. I am Ana Bermudez, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Probation, and sitting with me is Katrina Prelo, Neighborhood Opportunity Network Director. In addition to the incredible probation staff here with me today, I am joined by Carnegie Hall, our phenomenal partner in this work, who will also be speaking about this unique partnership. And not to mention, I've got to mention this now, the amazing number and of people from the community um, who will be talking to you later. Um, so I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify about this important work. So w one cannot truly explain um, the genesis of Neon Arts without, um, and the shift in community corrections work without focusing on the neighborhood opportunity networks themselves, the Neons, um, as a model. So Neons are neighborhood probation offices that are co-located with community-based organizations and service providers um, which create a one-stop shop for wraparounds of wraparound services for people on probation, their families, and their communities, which is a big piece of, of the model. And to do this effectively, we had to embed probation and the resources we bring in the seven New York City neighborhoods that most people on probation call home. The South Bronx, Harlem, Jamaica, Bed-Stuy, Brownsville, East New York, and Northern Staten Island. Neighborhoods that too often have been defined in some settings by their worst statistics. Through the NEON model in general, and NEON art specifically, we create an opportunity for residents of the NEON neighborhoods to redefine themselves publicly by their talents, potential, skills, and creativity. For those of you that haven't yet visited in NEON, this excerpt, excerpt from a book called Justice Reinvestment, Winding Back Imprisonment, by lead author D David Browns, paints a pretty vivid picture of our now internationally recognized probation model and what the authors describe as an inspiring example of how a traditional government criminal justice agency might be transformed to a vibrant local community center exuding a sense of activity and hope. The quote reads, a visit to the South Bronx Neon will really give you a very different feel for what a local justice investment initiative might look like. In the colorful and radically redesigned office, it is not immediately apparent exactly who were the staff, probationers, local citizens, community and health workers, friends, family, and others. The process of people reading examples of their poetry included all these, and indeed, the commissioner of probation, that was me at the time, reading a poem by her then 11-year-old then child, because I didn't have the confidence quite yet to do it. People were being assisted with healthcare res registrations, employment applications, and educational programs. Then the taxi driver who dropped us off at the Neon office told us that it was an excellent place doing great work. Only in New York. Um, the essence of the Neon model moved probation away from doing things to people and towards collaborating with them. To walk that walk, we had to provide an opportunity for those communities to sit at the table with us and have a voice in how we did this work. 
So we reached out to the community to establish a NEON stakeholder group for each NEON, comprised of individuals from local businesses, community and faith-based organizations, residents, probation staff, clients, and community leaders, like yourselves. In fact, each council member with a NEON in their district is an ex officio member of their local NEON stakeholder group. NEON stakeholders generously give their time and energy to ensure that each NEON has what it needs to best serve all of its residents, including those on probation, as they inherently know what their community needs most. Part of what makes the NEON arts mo model so innovative is the role that the NEON stakeholder groups play as the trustees of the collective decision-making power to determine which arts and cultural experiences the communities need and which artists and organizations are best suited to provide them. You will have the opportunity to hear from a lot of these amazing, amazing folks today, as many of them are here with us and will be testifying. Neon Arts began in 2013 as a small pilot project after the department repurposed some funding from the Young Men's Initiative. Five years later, our public-private partnership with the uniquely qualified Carnegie Hall Wild Music Institute has invested 1.9 million grant dollars of, of arts and cultural programming in underserved neighborhoods across the city. Thank you, Council Members Ampri Samuel, who's not here, but she, um, she and Council Member Gibson have supported Neon Arts um, with funds, and uh, that has allowed for increased art opportunities in Brownsville and the South Bronx, respectively. In the 14 rounds of arts programming to date, Neon Arts has awarded 130 grants, and 35% of the local art organizations and artists that have been awarded funding had annual operating budgets of less than $250,000. Uh, Chair Powers, you even saw some of the many different arts and cultural opportunities provided through Neon Arts at the culmination event this past September at Carnegie Hall. Though the arts and criminal justice may seem as unlikely as unlikely of a pairing as the Department of Probation and Carnegie Hall, helping to build and expand neon arts for the past five years has taught us that they are natural and necessary complements to one another. The arts are about creativity and positive self-expression, opportunities that many in the criminal justice system, their families, and their communities do not have access to or opportunities to engage in. But neon arts is changing that. Since the program's inception, neon arts has reached over 10,000 people citywide. Through participating in, planning, and being connected to this initiative, we started to notice a change not only in the participants, whether on probation or not, but in our staff and the broader community as well. We knew we were onto something big, as did some of the funders who commissioned an evaluation of the program. The Neon Arts Evaluation builds on the 2017 Social Impact of the Arts Study by the University of Pennsylvania which examined the impact that access to arts and cultural institutions and opportunities had on underserved neighborhoods of New York City, which were, you guessed it, all of our neon neighborhoods. The Penn study found that increased access to arts and culture in these communities using a network approach, and these are their words, not mine, had many positive outcomes, such as a 5% reduction in obesity, 14% reduction in child abuse and neglect cases, and an 18% increase in kids' educational attainment. Most striking of all was the finding that communities with access to arts and cultural opportunities had an 18% decrease in the serious crime rate compared to communities that did not. While not a direct causal relationship, this showed that the connection between arts and criminal justice is there, and that a holistic view of, the com of community corrections work must include increased access to the arts. In order to move the needle in our field, as host of the American Probation and Parole Association Summer Training Institute in New York City last year, we took the opportunity to showcase Neon Arts, the Neon Arts Initiative as our host event at Carnegie Hall. Community corrections professionals from around the country were amazed at the talent of the artists and the diversity of art forms, but especially that this initiative was a part of our probation continuum. That led to the department receiving the American Probation and Parole Association 2017 Excellence in Community Crime Prevention Award for the cutting edge use of arts in community corrections. Before getting into some of the findings of the Neon Arts Evaluation, I want to again thank you Chair Powers and Chair Van Bramer, as well as Council Member Vanessa Gibson for joining us at the evaluation announcement last week. I can honestly say that was the most fun and joyful press conference I've ever been to and the young talent of the Renaissance Youth Choir always blows me away. 
Conducting an evaluation of an initiative like Neon Arts, essentially trying to quantify human interaction is not typical. In fact, one of the unique facets of the evaluation was the way in which the young people were engaged to play such a crucial part in the evaluation process by helping to shape the survey questions and serving as a bridge to the focus groups. Even the evaluators reported self-transformation from conducting this evaluation. Though it was not our intention to have such a strong impact on the people conducting the evaluation, I think it is worth noting in regards to not only the power of this program, but the unique model as well. A few statistics from the evaluation that really resonated with what we're trying to do in providing these opportunities for people on probation and their communities are that 80% of participants look forward a lot to taking part in the daily Neon Arts event. And 91% of the time, it was an event they had never before experienced. Participating in Neon Arts resulted in all of the young people feeling that they know more adults who care about them. And we know the importance of that um, for growing up and being successful adults. All participants learned a new skill. Most participants felt more hopeful about their future from being a part of Neon Arts. And participating in Neon Arts resulted in the young people getting along better with others. The great success of Neon Arts has created additional opportunities for us to expand and grow a number of other ex arts experiences, which greatly benefit people on probation and communities throughout the city. I'm gonna start calling Neon Arts the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> this afternoon, I will briefly walk you through those opportunities, those other opportunities, Freeverse, our public artists in residence, the Made in New York animation project, Neon Photography, and Neon Inspires. Free Verse is a poetry workshop offered in the Neon waiting rooms that turn wait time into creative time. Born and bred in the South Bronx Neon waiting room five years ago, Free Verse invites community members, professional writers, and probation staff to read, write, sing, and perform during a weekly open mic. Freeverse also produces an annual magazine, provides jobs for writing apprentices, and publishes books, the latest of which we have provided for each of you today. One of our greatest champions of Freeverse, Tahara, was on probation and struggling to pass her high school equivalency exam. It was through participating in Freeverse that she built the confidence to persevere and pass the HSC on her fifth try. Tahara has since gone on to college and published her own book of poetry. Part of the Department of Cultural Affairs Municipal Residency Program, the Public Artists in Residence, is based on the premise that artists are creative problem solvers and therefore embeds socially engaged artists in New York City municipal agencies in order to use creative collaborative art practices to propose and implement creative solutions to pressing civic challenges. The department is thrilled to have Rachel Barnard executive director and founder of Young New Yorkers, which provides arts-based diversion programs to court-involved young people as our public artists in residence. Rachel's work has helped over 600 young people sentenced to make art with Young New Yorkers instead of jail or other adult sanctions. The department first got to work with Young New Yorkers in a formal capacity as part of the Neon Arts, a part of Neon Arts, where she was instrumental in our Love Letters to Brownsville event a couple of years ago when New York City First Lady Charlene McRae visited the Bronzeville Neon. This evolution from Neon Arts grantee to public artists in residence is emblematic of how this model and initiative allows government to collaborate with local organizations on the ground to be effective in this work. Another great arts experience that incubated through Neon Arts is the Made in New York Animation Project, a partnership between the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, Neons, and the Animation Project the Made in New York Animation Project provides youth across New York City the opportunity to engage in storytelling, gain technical 3D computer animation skills, and qualify for paid internships in this evolving field. In its first year, the program created and screened 72 animated films across 15 sites, either a local neon or school, and con connected over 1,800 youth ages 12 to 24 to this important skill. As workforce development is a major component of this opportunity, in the first year, Made in New York Animation Project was able to promote 99 interns to paid teaching assistants working alongside professional animators. Our latest expanded arts experience is Neon Photography, which provides professional photography training in the history of photography, technical skills, and the art of visual storytelling. 
This paid opportunity launched in Brooklyn in March and will expand to all seven NEONs across the five boroughs next cycle. Four mentors from our Arches Transformative Mentoring Program who graduated from the initial workshop now have paid positions teaching the bed workshops, an incredible synergy between two successful programs. And yes, council members, they are available to take pictures for your events. Um, 14 of these amazing, talented photographers are here with us today. Some you may recognize from last week at the Neon Arts Evaluation Press Conference and um, are looking forward to testifying about the impact that this opportunity has had on their lives. And just even organically today, they've connected with your photographer, in fact, um, <laughs> to share tips, et cetera. Um, you actually may have seen, already seen the work of the neon photographers because they've done commercial photo shoots for Park Avenue Pianos, photography for the John McEnroe Foundation's annual fundraising gala in the Hamptons, and even provided the mayor's office, DOP, Carnegie Hall, Neon Sports, Neon Arts, and the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade with event photography. One of the most powerful outcomes of the Neon Photography Program has been the intergenerational connections in the community. Two of the workshop participants are father and son, and their relationship and has significantly grown and been strengthened through participating in this opportunity. In our bed workshop, most of the participants are between the ages of 18 to 24, but there is one community participant in his early 80s who joined the class as an opportunity to grow and evolve because he believes that everyone should continue to reinvest themselves throughout their lives. By creating an environment for clients and the community to come together around the arts, it organically created a new mentor for these young people and a new purpose for a community elder. Finally, Neon Inspires aims to bring about interactive youth-led conversations with cultural icon icons that inspire ideas, foster learning, and provoke change. Hosted at Carnegie Hall, these opportunities provide young people with the chance to interview and engage with some of the top talent in their field. We would like to invite you to our next Neon Inspires on Monday, January 7th, featuring Michael K. Williams from HBO's The Wire and Boardwalk Empire in a discussion and screening of Raised in the System, a documentary about youth in the criminal and juvenile justice systems. It is sure to be a truly powerful conversation, one you won't want to miss. I sometimes say that if I could rename the, my department, I would change it to the Department of Humanity, and this is where our connection continues. Because, as you have heard from my testimony, the arts provides a necessary vehicle for individuals and communities to tap into and express their humanity. Chair Van Bramer, you put it perfectly at the evaluation announcement, so I'm uh, going to quote you, because this I, I'm, I'm taking this with me uh, for, for, for my life. Every human being, regardless of where they're born, what income level their family has, or whether or not they've been involved in the criminal justice system, every human being has beauty and power inside of them. What we do as a society is we push people down and we prevent that power and that beauty from coming out of their mouths, out of their hands, and out of their minds. The Neon Arts Program is all about making sure that everyone's beauty and power has the ability to express and manifest itself as that makes us, all of us, better people. And you don't hear that being said about people in the criminal justice system every day. And it's so important to keep that front and center of what we're doing. So thank you again, Chair Powers and Chair Van Bramer and the members of these two committees for the opportunity to testify about the important and innovative art programs and partnerships at the Department of Probation. We will be happy to answer any questions that you may have after hearing from our great partner in this work, Carnegie Hall. Thank you very much. I just want to int interrupt uh, the proceedings for a second um, and say whoever uh, thought to put this in our packets um, deserves a promotion. Um, uh, I used to do <laughs> uh, I used to do intergovernment affairs before I got elected for a major nonprofit, and we would stress over what you put in the packet for the elected officials. And sometimes you think, oh, they're never going to look at any of that, right? But I looked at this, it is remarkable. It is a remarkable document, and there's great power in producing something like this, so that those people who have been counted out uh, get to see themselves, their work, their names, right? There's actually great power in seeing your name in this publication. 
and then to be able to share it with other people. Uh, it's beautiful, it's remarkable, so kudos to everyone uh, for putting that together and sharing it with us. We're gonna, we're, we're gonna, no, sorry, we're gonna ask Carnegie Hall to testify and then we're gonna take, we're gonna reopen the vote uh, to finish the vote we did. I just wanted to know, cause, cause actually Councilman Van Bramer wrote this to me before you said it, which is our wonderful photographer, Bill Atrist, who's here, and I, I noticed as well, is working with the folks who are part of the Neon Photography Program, and he's taking pictures. He's not even listening to me give him a big shout out. But thank you to, to Bill Alatrist for, for, <laughs> uh, he really believes in the power of the work he does, and you can see that because as he mentors the other people who are here, so we give him a lot of credit for that as well. Bill, Bill photographs all of our committees, but I know there's a little part of his soul that loves my cultural affairs committee an awful lot. Because <laughs> he really feels the arts and the power of the arts, and I, I think that's emblematic of who he is and what he's doing right now in this hearing. Uh, Dave, I'm David Freudenthal. I'm the Government Relations Director at Carnegie Hall, and you, uh, you, you heard from the, from the commissioner um, uh, ab about the work, and you're going to hear from my great colleague and brother, uh, James Horton, in a minute, who runs this program at Carnegie Hall, the director of our social impact uh, portfolio. And I really just want to take a quick moment to say a shout out to our chairs, Keith Powers and Jam Jimmy Van Bramer, for uh, shining a light on this work. The work has been happening, and it's like if the tree falls in the forest, it makes a difference for, for this work to be, for, for awareness to be raised, and for folks to know it. And we're so grateful for, to Councilmember Rivera for being here, to Councilmember Holden, and to Camp, Councilmember uh, Amprey Samuel, and thank you very much for the support that you provided to the program. Uh, we couldn't do this work without you. We are grateful for it. We, we believe, we, we get that you, um, uh, understand that arts, um, there's a role for arts in, uh, in the city's efforts to develop holistic responses uh, to, to reform the justice system. And, and, th th and we are proud to partner with this fantastic agency in doing, that, doing the, this work. And with that, I turn it over to James Horton. Thank you so much, David. Um, like David said, I'm James C. Horton, Director of Social Impact Programs for Carnegie Hall. And since 2013, the Hall has worked with probation to deliver the Neon Arts programs. Our work together brought together young people, community leaders, local artists and arts organizations, and others to help seven of the highest needs neighborhoods in New York City. We are proud of the many successes, the many stories that have come out of Neon Arts over the years. They illustrate the transformative power of the arts and community to create creative potential that exists in every young person if given the opportunity to be involved in this type of programming. I just wanna give you one example. Kyle, one of our participants in the spring 2018 Staten Island Projectivity Workshop is now employed as a program assistant at the Wild Music Institute at Carnegie Hall. We are always thinking about building employment pathways for participants to experience the program differently, to experience a career and a pathway to a career differently. To date, Carnegie Hall and Neon Arts partner organizations and agencies have employed 37 Neon Arts participants as interns and apprentices. Carnegie Hall also provides Neon Arts participants with a chance to enhance their artistry and gain exposure to cultural experiences. These opportunities have included attendances, attendance at Carnegie Hall performances in Stern Auditorium, Neon Arts showcases in the Hall's Resnick Education Wing, and group field trips to other cultural organizations. One of the most recent examples of this was a concert, a time like this, Music for Social Change. As a part of Carnegie Hall's 60th 60s Festival, Poets from the program performed on the main stage at Carnegie Hall and Stern Auditorium, reciting an original poem with the show's host, Lemon Anderson. Everyone involved in this project has changed. Everyone, Carnegie Hall included. 
The deep dive into this space over the last decade has educated the organization, the board, staff, on the justice system in ways that the hall can serve as a critical component to help shape what this landscape might look like. If we're able to use arts and imagine a little more, imagine a little greater, and use that to change humanity and individuals in the system. Neon Arts has also helped forge a unique relationship between law enforcement agencies and a cultural institution. It's one of the great joys of this work to be able to collaborate with Commissioner Bermudez and her team and Katrina and Kate. The Hall staff enjoy such a collegial and constructive relationship with probation and the probation team is invested in this work and it's evident through the strong relationships we've built with the NEON. This program is a prime example of the robust public-private endeavor that is taking a new approach to addressing some of our city's most pressing issues. We're grateful for the administration's supports of the partnership through the Mayor's Grant for Cultural Impact and initiative of the Department of Cultural Affairs. The supports partnership between New York City's municipal agencies and cultural organizations to use and culture to reach underserved and vulnerable New Yorkers. Based on the success we have seen here in New York City, it is our hope that this model of neon arts can serve as a model for law enforcement agencies across the country. We thank the committee for their interest in this program and we encourage the council to support neon arts and other programs by our cultural colleagues across the city. We urge your continued investment in programs that build on strengths, build on technology and transparency, and invest in youth development. These programs invest in the future. This program invests in helping young people shape a vision and create a vision for their lives that I've not seen many other programs do. Thank you. And thanks to probation grantees and organizations, stakeholders, and of course, the amazingly talented and gifted young people who participate in Neon Arts programming and for being a part of these transformational changes that we've seen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that great testimony. And thank you for all of, all of you for being here today. Um, I wanted to do, first recognize that we've been joined by, I think David got some of it, but uh, Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Amprey Samuel, and Councilmember Rivera. I believe Councilmember Amprey Samuel, maybe Councilmember Rose as well, have programs in their districts. Um, and uh, as I noted, we're going to just reopen the vote for the members of the, the Criminal Justice Committee to take a vote on the two bills that are before us today. And then one other programming note, both myself and Councilman Van Bramer are members of the Finance Committee, which is next door. So if you see us get up and take a break, it's just to go and, uh, and to get our attendance at the Department of Finance, I mean, uh, Finance Committee. Um, with that being said, we're going to take the roll call on the two bills. Continuation, excuse me, continuation roll call, Committee on Criminal Justice, introductions 1090A and 933B. Council Member Amprey Samuel. I vote aye on all, but can I just say one little thing because I do have to leave. I have a meeting downstairs with the police commissioner and the speaker. Um, I, I, for me it was a no-brainer when I was elected to um, the city council to be supportive of the um, neon like space and program, um, but what made me um, even more of a supporter is being able to participate in the different programs and um, uh, events that are held at 444. And it would just warm your heart to see um, just a level of engagement and excitement and not just with Department of Probation, but the space itself. And I just want everyone to know that you will continue to um, receive my support above and beyond. And we are um, now in conversations to increase and enhance what your space look like outside of your actual office, the entire um, building at 444. And so I just look forward to even more programs and initiatives and projects and opportunities in Brownsville. And you have, your, you have my support. Thank you. 
Councilmember Rivera. <clears throat> Probably vote aye on all. Both items are adopted by a final vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Great, thank you. Now we'll resume our programming. Um, so thank you. I want to start off with some questions for, for, both, for both groups. Um, the starting is, you mentioned the seven neighborhoods that you're in today. Uh, have you, I, two questions. One is, have you been in those neighborhoods since the inception, or have you expanded? And second, are there other places or neighborhoods or opportunities that you're looking at in terms of, uh, in terms of expansion and growth? So yes, we have been in those communities since we, uh, since we began, and we in fact have 15 sites across the city, which includes neon satellites in some of the neighborhoods where there are not as many residents who are under probation supervision. Um, for instance, we have three satellites in Staten Island. We have two, one in East Harlem, one in West Harlem, two in the Northern Bronx as well. Got it. And are there other opportunities you're looking at in terms of expansion or more satellites or other growth? And yes. maybe can you tell us how you identified those locations? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we um, sort of really just went block to block to look and see what was happening in those communities and look at different spaces and talk to the residents of those communities. Um, we are looking to expand in the Edenwall section of the Bronx as well. Got it. it it's mostly decided by the concentration of people who are on probation who call those locations home. And then, the, and so the satellites are still places where there's a fair amount of people on probation, but the, the critical mass is not there to have people, I mean, probation officers full time, dedicated full time to those areas. So I think the reach of the programs goes beyond the neon neighborhoods, but in terms of location where we are located, it, other than Edenwald, I think we're, we're pretty much where we need to be. Got it, thanks. And the other uh, to follow up question on that is, um, do, can you just maybe walk us through some of the challenges or, or, uh, or obstacles you have in terms of opening and operating any of the sites that you have? You know, the usual suspects of issues of, you know, um, uh, not, you know, people don't always know what we do at probation. Um, you know, sometimes it, it's seen initially as, as not something that folks might want in, in a community, but that is quickly, thankfully, turned around by our meeting with folks and, and um, citing examples of, of what we do, having programs like this, because it's very important. When you're doing a NEON, it's really a joint, it has to be a joint partnership. It can't be government waltzing in and saying, okay, our way or the highway, right? Um, that doesn't work. That, that has, had been tried before, in fact. That was an, an uh, earlier iteration in many years before me of m probation moving into the community. And so we purposely uh, formed the NEON stakeholder groups for the NEON so that there would be, it's almost like participatory budgeting, but it's participatory decision making around what needs are in the community, what things can uh, need to happen out of the NEONs, um, uh, not just in arts, but we have um, uh, nutrition kitchens in each of the NEONs, we have clothing closets, we have other services that are open, not just for people on probation, but for the communities as well. And can you talk about any predecessor? You, you sort of mentioned some earlier programs. Can you mention, what, what, what year did NEON start? The NEON started in 2012, okay. 11, 2011, 2012, under my predecessor, uh, Commissioner Schiraldi. Um, and uh, what I was talking about just now, though, was eons ago of when community corrections went into the community was sometimes just moving an office without a change of culture, if you will. But that's, since 2011, we've been moving into a much more, um, uh, engaging form of probation, not just with the people on probation, but with communities. And that's when it started. Got it. And can you tell us uh, when, at the, in, you were, I guess, I don't know if you were there, but when, it turns, when the, at the inception of the program, what was the thinking around why this was necessary versus what was in place? I mean, you mentioned a little bit about what the, the need for uh, restructuring and a new program. You know, it was it was from listening to communities. Um, we had our leadership uh, at that time was very uh, committed to um, 
bringing back community into community corrections. And so we did a lot of, uh, you know, meetings with communities to hear and with our, with our own clients to hear what would help um, people be more successful on probation and communities be more of a support system as well um, around the people on probation. And so, um, and then emerging research that this was helpful. It, a little, this is a little something, but, but it, it plays huge. Somebody who needs to go to probation after work and they work near their home or in their communities can just show, can just walk over to the probation office. When we have the probation officers be able to, um, you know, go walking around the neighborhood with someone to assess what are the challenges for this person to succeed. Families can drop by, right, and come in and either avail themselves of services or speak to a probation officer, uh, you know, about their, their, their young person on probation. Things like that, just, it just made a lot of sense. Um, and then also uh, be able to, to do case planning in a way that took into account the daily life of a person instead of being tucked away in a, in a, in an office building near the, near the court, near the courts or in the courts. Got it. And how do you, how do you measure success in terms of the program? So the evaluation is the, a big measure of, of the success. Um, you know, it has to, the, the neon arts is about connecting people. Chair Van Bremer mentioned it before. This is about creating opportunity, right? That's where we're, what we're looking at. Part of um, having people be able to desist from crime, let's say, or never get into it in the first place is that web of opportunities and the ability to envision a future, right? And so this provides a vehicle um, on many levels to be able to achieve that and the evaluation shows that the, the connection to, to others, the young people connecting to adults. That is huge, both in the youth development field, as, as James mentioned before, um, and in uh, best practices, right, around young people becoming successful in life. It's about wellness. You can't always just be, like, in youth development, the big thing is absence of problems doesn't mean success or the ability to, to be able to manage your life, right? So we have to be able to provide skills. So in the evaluation it says, most of the people who, uh, if not all of the people were trying something new, 91% I think it was, um, had an experience that they had never had before. They had developed particular skills that they had hoped for the future. Our young people, I can't tell you how many young people are on probation who don't think they're gonna be alive next week. So the ability to think beyond and have an, the ability to, to dream up a future, often from a, a, a skill they didn't even know they had, to have their name on a book, to be, you know, to go from anything you say can and will be used against you to anything you say can uh, provide you with a better future, I mean, that's huge. Um, and so, so that's, that's all of, of the findings in the evaluation to us are the success markers of this program. Okay, thanks. Um, and how do, how do community organizations get selected and become part of your network? So the, the way that they get selected is they have an opportunity to come in and meet the stakeholder groups to talk about the projects that they would like to propose for those communities and then they actually submit an application to the stakeholders. The stakeholders review those applications, they select the top three, and then usually they put those top three before young people to allow them to choose and participate in which projects come to the NEON. And how do they find you in the first place? How do they, how do you make yourself aware, how do you make people aware of that you're a potential, uh, that they have the opportunity to, borrow, to work with you? Sure, so a lot of that is done by Carnegie Hall's marketing department, as well as those who are involved in NEON programming being able to get out there and spread the word about the program to other fellow artists, other community-based arts organizations. So a lot of the, I think the most effective recruitment of local artists to be service providers is by word of mouth. Got it, and can I ask, just follow up on that? So for Carnegie Hall particularly, can you tell us how you got involved originally and, and what was the motivation for being involved? Obviously, a lot of opportunities for Carnegie Hall in the city, what drove you to this and how you got involved and maybe talk more about your relationship and sure. role in this process. Sure, so Carnegie Hall have been doing um, justice work for a number of years now through several other programs 
Uh, Musical Connections is our longest standing justice program working with men at Sing Sing. Um, and the program's inception predates my involvement with the organization, but from my understanding, it was a conversation that happened pretty quickly, uh, but actually over time, being able to cultivate this relationship with the Department of Probation and looking at alternative strategies for engaging young people who are in difficult circumstances and noticing that arts has been a primary tool for engaging that particular uh, set of young people. So conversations sparked with Katrina, with the commissioner, uh, and with several other of my colleagues who are in the room who could probably speak to that a little bit more. Uh, and then one thing led to another, and uh, we ended up putting together the pilot program in 2013, working with Carnegie, and then it's expanded ever since to involve different facets of the program. Uh, I think finding ways to engage young people more and more in the internship and apprenticeship opportunities. So it's taken on sort of the infancy form of being community-based, working with the community and, and doing that same rigor of uh, soliciting the organizations that Katrina spoke about, but then expanding more and more uh, as the years have progressed and we found out that the program needs more to move forward. Uh, and the young people are engaged in different ways uh, to be apprenticeships and look at this actually as a career pathway. And which programs are most attended? In terms of the NEONs? Yeah. Uh, it, it varies borough to borough, and depending on the art project that has been introduced uh, through each one of the stakeholders in each one of the boroughs, uh, the seven neon sites. So you, can you give us some examples of ones that are in most demand uh, or most attended? So, uh, so, I, so I'll, I'll give an example. One of the programs that the young people tend to gravitate towards is called Fame Project. And it's the ones that created those amazing shirts that you all have. And the reason I believe that they really enjoy it is because of the entrepreneurial portion of it that really allows them to learn a new skill and to do, um, to create income for themselves through the arts. Got it, okay. Um, we'll get uh, the, just a couple more questions, I'll hand it to, and then we'll let members and Council Member Van Bramer take over and then ask questions. Um, just can you talk about your funding? How much money is, in, is funded for NEON? What are the sources of it? Uh, let, let's start those two questions. So the, this is the, the part of the beauty of this model is that it's a, a public-private venture, right? So there is money that we put in from government um, in the form of, you know, from probation to um, city council, you know, uh, funding as well as then, um, you know, DCLA. Why am I? And then there's um, foundation money. There is also um, uh, mostly foundation. The um, Carnegie Hall is not a funding agent. There are project, essentially TA, project manager of it, but they also then provide in, between in-kind and other direct funds um, as well. And so, so there's not an actual uh, budget in the, for the projects, the, it's very nimble in terms of, you know, growing it and quote unquote shrinking it depending on how much money there is, but all the, um, and it can be targeted um, uh, for the different, for different uh, uh, locations, right? So there's funding that can go, to, you know, for a particular project in a particular location, or it can go to Neon Arts in general to be divided it up um, you know, through throughout the city, uh, we also have some federal dollars as well. What is but what is the total? How much is money does the city put into the, the from oh, the sorry. city? Oh, sorry. So annually, about you would see about um, of direct funds. Again, there's in kind. There's all sorts of other stuff. About five hundred and fifty thousand a year. Got it. And has that grown over years, or has it stayed about the same? About it's the been same. About the you same because the, there's a, just there. It's worked out that way in a strange way, but there's a different composition of the funding every fiscal year. Got it. And have you guys have requested more money? If so, how much? And uh, is there other, we're heading into budget season, so are there opportunities to expand that you would be asking for more money for? Well, we, we are always raising money, you know, th you know, private dollars in terms of, you know, we're pretty secure in the, in the money that we have coming uh, from, from within, and the city council is free to, you know, certainly, you know, we're never, never say no to, um, you know, individual uh, uh, grants from, from the city council for your, for your particular districts or generally 
um, and uh, as uh, Council Member Gibson and Ampri Samuels have have done in the past, that c can increase also the projects that happen in their in their communities. Don't be can so I, shy. Can I, can I just reiterate to that that yeah. you know that we are everything that the commissioner said is true. We are um, we are uh, as as the council member said, Carnegie Hall is delivering the program. We are working very hard constantly to seek. Uh, both public and private money for this program, and we could do more uh, if we had more help from the council. He's a good representative. For, uh, uh, I'm going to stop there so members can ask questions. I know, I know the chair has some questions as well. Uh, thank I have a couple more, but I'll come back to them. I'm going to go check in. All right. Well, the chair goes to uh, check in at finance, which I just did myself. Uh, we'll follow up on uh, some of the questions. So uh, uh, just a point of clarification, David, you just said you would do more if the council uh, was able to come up with some more. I assume you also mean if the mayor's office and the administration came up with more funding, you'd be able to do more as well. Absolutely. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, there's a, this has been a, a real partnership between, uh, between the, the, the agency, uh, the administration at Carnegie Hall, and, uh, and we, none of us could do it uh, with, without, without the others, and, 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 and to that note, I just got to like turn around and look at all the other people in this room that we couldn't happen without. Uh, they are key to it. That's right. So let me just go back to uh, Commissioner Bermudez. Um, so uh, the funding aspect of this, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the human aspect of it, right? But the funding piece is important because you can't do the work without uh, the money. So we have worked very hard, uh, both Commissioner Finkelpearl and I, for the last couple of years, obviously with the support of uh, uh, both speakers that we've uh, served under and, uh, and this council to increase funding for the Department of Cultural Affairs uh, rather significantly over the last couple of years. So uh, even though we were successful in doing that, this program's budget uh, from DCLA has essentially remained flat or, or the same? Would that be your assessment of it? I mean, you know, I, I can't quantify all of it, uh, but it's, it's been, yeah, it's been the same. Okay, so I think part of our work then is, as we've increased funding for the Department of Cultural Affairs rather significantly, and, and the mayor's office and Commissioner Finkel-Pearl have been instrumental in that working with the council, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that a little bit of extra goes to this program as part of that just greater give, funding. Just to give credit where it's due, the, um, uh, as was noted earlier in testimony, the mayor's grant for cultural impact has twice made $50,000 awards to support this work. And that yeah, you need a lot more than that, though, Absolutely. David. You need a lot more than $50,000. Um, thank you. Do I hear an amen in the room for that? <laughs> um, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, so I just want to also say we've never had this many photographers <laughs> in a Committee on Cultural Affairs hearing, which uh, is both very exciting for elected officials, but also I want to say to the point of the program, because I assume uh, other than Bill, uh, all the other folks uh, photographing us are in the program, right? Um, so someone walk me through the, the photography program and, and how do folks get these great, beautiful cameras and, and are they uh, uh, theirs um, to use uh, at any time to practice their craft as they're at home in their neighborhoods and, and, and photographing their worlds and where do we see the, the photos? Because uh, we certainly want to see all the photos from this hearing. Um, and, and, and what does that look like, right? I mean, because it's an exciting thing. I, I, I love photography. I, obviously, we're not as skilled as Bill um, and all of these uh, terrific young people, but uh, it's a great way to see the world, right? And the, the lens and the perspectives that you see through it. And it, it's, it's, I think, empowering also. So walk me through what all these young people are doing here and how it's working. Uh, and uh, I think it's fascinating. So, so this project was modeled um, after the NYCHA photography workshop um, that ga gave residents of public housing an opportunity to document their lives, right? Um, 
uh, and express themselves through photography. Um, and that, that culminated in, in a book published um, uh, by Powerhouse Book Publication called Project Lives. And so we, um, we uh, partnered with Seeing for Ourselves, uh, which is also the organization that, that co-created Project Lives. Um, and we have um, an NEA grant, and then Sigma uh, um, photography, uh, the Sigma uh, cameras um, have been donated. So Sigma is also has been uh, a partner here. Then um, from from the um, from government, the Work uh, Progress Program uh, that is. Uh, from an uh, NYC Opportunity and HRA pays the stipends. So the, again, it's it's all the same kind of idea of really bringing people together, different entities together to create something. We don't know what the project's gonna look like at the end, but at the end there will be a book, um, much like Project Lives, um, about the, the trajectory of the young people and not so young people who participated yeah. in, in the neon photography. Um, and it's become much more than that too. It's been a vehicle for, you know, um, work, advancement, opportunities, a future, it's fantastic, so. Well, I, I hope whether, whether um, this hearing makes the cut or not in the books, that you share them with all of the Absolutely. members of the city council um, as a way of amplifying the work and making sure that we see uh, what was produced. And, and so are the cameras uh, um, the participants to keep? Um, is that something they're able to leave the program with or? So, um, yes, they're, they are, they take home and use throughout the, well, no, I'm sorry, no, they, I'm not sure they keep the cameras. I, somebody can correct me, but they can use them, they will use them throughout the program right. and can take them home. They're not in a, in a box somewhere that right. they, they right. take them out every time. But, that's great. Um, that's and is the program, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm asking you a level of detail that, that uh, the program managers would have, but uh, do you work to create like Instagram accounts and other ways to amplify and show the work, right, which is very powerful? I believe that is true. We have, actually I forgot to say that we have one person on staff, Chelsea Davis is fantastic, who's championing this uh, uh, project. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, as you can see, yeah. Um, and uh, this is a ridiculously happy group of people. Yes. <laughs> like every time you say something, everyone behind you, I wish you could see behind me everyone's smiling, <laughs> everyone's clapping, They're everyone's ones, happy. You know, yes. This is so not where the world is right now. And it's so good to see. And I mean this seriously because. You know, as elected officials, we see so many folks come in, whether they're nonprofits or, or city agencies, and I've said this to a few people that I've met, every once in a while, you, there's an executive director or, or a CEO or a commissioner comes in, and they're so wildly passionate about the work, right, that they excite you about the work that they're doing, and, and you are that. Right, and this program and this group is that because how could you leave this room and not be inspired, not feel good about this program, not want to invest more money in this program? And I don't know if you hired all these people and all our actors behind you, but they're doing a great job. I promise. They're doing a great job. Uh, in <laughs> I'm sure there is an acting uh, portion of this, no? Or is there a performing well, there's arts? Been, yes, no, there has been. Uh, right. Some of the grantees have been, you know, uh, theater companies. So uh, let me ask you, uh, uh, I mean, they're all serious questions, but so folks come in and, and obviously you want uh, as many of your, your clients as possible to participate in the program, right, and to experience all of this. But not everyone's going to want to, right? Maybe not everyone's in a position to. Um, how, how do you do that work of encouraging folks who are coming uh, um, into the system or into contact with their POs and then, and then get them in and then if they're not responsive at first, um, how, do you, how do you keep saying there's this great opportunity and if you just saw you know, through it, you would, you would be able to experience all this? So um, this, it's an art form in and of itself sure. <laughs> to get uh, people to participate, but it's, it's very tied to the work that we're doing at a, case management level, if you will, um, at probation. Probation officers match 
um, the people they supervise to opportunities to growth through the through what we call the individual action plan. And the beauty of this is also that it's not just once a year that Neon Arts takes place, there's four cycles a year. So what it requires is a probation officer never to give up, which is sometimes hard, but even you know the incremental steps of trying something, as you said, is a victory, right? And so it, it some people take to it right away, um, and some people n n don't necessarily. Um, some of the programs that we've had, like Freeverse and now that it's expanding, it's based in our waiting area, so nobody can escape it. Because the poets go around saying, okay, what, give me a few words, you know, give me a few, whatever. And whatever's happening that day, they really encourage people. And sometimes, uh, you know, like you've said before, and we share this view, it's also like, it's such a basic human need to express yourself that once, I think once our officers were also very involved in it, they can they can talk about it in a way that resonates with a person. You know, this is about your your ability to express yourself, to get out some uh, out from under some of the 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 thinking that got you in trouble, right? Um, and and that transformation starts right. happening. Well, and and so many people have experienced great trauma in their lives, I right? Know. Even if it's not thought of as such or or you know diagnosed as such. And if you hold all of that trauma inside, mm -hmm. right, uh, it can do very, very bad things to your mind, body, and soul, right? So it's important to, to express yourself. So I told you all one of my uh, happiest stories in my career as the chair of cultural affairs and libraries, uh, and I'll repeat it here because most folks here didn't hear it, but then I want to hear some of yours, right, where the power of the arts to change lives, right? We, we know it, we see it, and every once in a while we experience it. And so uh, when I got elected, and I represent PS 111, which is a school that serves primarily the Queensbridge houses, uh, and when I first went in uh, to PS 111 as the council member, the principal showed me their brand new dance studio, uh, which had been refurbished, but she told me that uh, it wasn't used because there was no money for a dance teacher, and uh, I thought that was an absolute disgrace. So we brought in Alvin Ailey and created a program, and now Alvin Ailey operates uh, at PS 111. And when I went to the end of school year performance, uh, all of the young people performed all of these great dances, and at the end there was a freestyle performance where all the young people were encouraged to just sort of go out there and dance. And they were all very shy, um, but ultimately, uh, uh, eighth grader Stacy went out and performed and did an amazing freestyle dance. And afterwards, I went up to the stage and I told her you were amazing and inspirational. And the principal uh, pulled me aside and she said, when she started this school year, she was non-communicative. Uh, and it was a very, very bad time for her in her life. But this program and her ability to dance with these dancers from Alvin Ailey has like changed her life. Uh, we've now followed her through high school. Um, so I know that that $20,000 CASA grant bringing Alvin Ailey into PS111 changed Stacy's life. Uh, and I know your program is doing the same thing for your clients. So maybe you can share some of those powerful stories that you're aware of and all of you have experienced. You will hear them yourself, personally from the people themselves. I think that's a better you know, vehicle for that. I, certainly I've seen plenty, but we have them in, per, in, in the flesh today. So, so I'm gonna take a pass at that one. And and that is the best non-response to a question. <laughs> that I have ever heard from an administration official. <laughs> uh, um, thank you. So I want to recognize Council Member Moya has joined us from uh, the Cultural Affairs Committee. And uh, I know that we all have more questions, but I want to get to our colleagues. And I believe Council Member Bob Holden from the great borough of Queens. Thank you very first. much for that one. Thank you. This is such a great and entertaining committee, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Uh, I want to echo, by the way, this, this, mag this magazine or book is, is wonderful. I want to echo uh, uh, Councilman Ben Bramer's uh, praise. It's amazing. And I just want to, while we're on stories, I want to tell you one personal story. Um, the art saved my life, actually. Um, and it changed my life. 
I was 14 or 15 in high school, feeling lost. And I loved the art class and um, did a drawing, a couple of drawings actually, and they got published in the, in the magazine, the school magazine. And all of a sudden, I became elevated as a person. Mm -hmm. And it's so important. This, you realize that this can change lives. I guess you do realize that. But it changed my I, Once I got in that magazine, I started to walk down the hallways of the school, and everybody started to notice me. Mm -hmm. And before I was alone, and now I had people, oh, great drawing. It was a hockey player, a couple of drawings of hockey players in, in a charcoal. And I loved the arts, I always did. And my art teacher suggested a college that you know, I said, well, I want to pursue the arts. I like that. I got noticed and um, went on for a career in the visual arts, graphic design, um, got into photography. So I, I, I loved how these students are, you know, going around taking pictures. And, um, and it's just amazing how I became a college professor and uh, uh, photographer later on, went into graphic design. So it actually, it really raises your self-worth because you, all, you find out you have talents and people react to the talents. And it's a tremendous, um, this is such a tremendous, I was reading some of the poems, it was just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and whatever we can do, we, can, we should double the budget for this. Um, and, um, um, we, you know, I, I, like I've been through some committee. This is this is such a great committee, such an inspiring uh, hearing. I want to thank both chairs. But um, when you talk, when they see their names in here, when they see their poems, what kind of reactions do you get? Do people say, oh, "I want to, you know, pursue this in, as a career"? Or I want to go into college. What, what, tell me what some of the great stories you're hearing. Well, there's a young man actually um, who I don't think is here today, so I guess I'll tell his story. Um, through he. He was very down on probation. For, nobody ever wants to be at probation. And then um, through Neon Arts, he discovered poetry um, and, and was part of free verse and then started thinking, much like y your situation, well, maybe I can be a poetry teacher. And, whoever, you know, and so it, it starts expanding. And, and when people, you know, um, see their names, it just, it's a topic of conversation of pride. Oftentimes, the young people that participate, uh, that are on, on probation, have never had family members be able to celebrate anything because they haven't graduated from the eighth grade or, the, or from high school or whatever. When we have these events, it's like, that's when the families come in and reconnect and and you see that as 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 such an, amazing and inspiring experience. So, so yes, it's quite intense when we have a, um, a publishing party, if you will, at the, at the various neons. Keep it up, it's great. Uh, is there, there's magazines for photographers and visual arts? So that has been just the, the written word. Um, uh, the photography project will come out with a book, but I, I guess we're gonna have to think of other publications that we're gonna have to, <laughs> you know, uh, create from their photography, which has been fantastic. But I'd like to help with it, if not to thank consult you. with it or design, help you yeah. design it. Absolutely. I'd like to, yes. thank you. Right. You're, you're on. First of all, do we not all love Bob Holden? I mean, honestly, <laughs> just crushing yes. it here, Bob. Um, <laughs> also, I just want to say thank you. Um, uh, for saying that this is a really entertaining committee. I do think the Cultural Affairs <laughs> Committee is like like right up there, right? Um, one of the best. Um, so I, I know we really want to hear from the participants uh, in the program as well. Uh, luckily, we have uh, some great council members uh, who would like to say a few words as well. And Council Member Rose is the first. Thank you. Um, and I'm not on such fun committees, um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm enjoying this. Um, I, um, I think that, you know, NEON really um, should be called opportunity. It, um, it provides, it opens up a vast array of opportunities for, um, for people who otherwise have not had them. 
You know, and the fact that um, young people, um, former um, offenders, are become published authors, published authors. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people can say that in their life that they're published authors. And you know, then the value of participating in the arts we know transcends all the boundaries that's imposed by um, by society. You're um, giving them marketable skills, a viable outlet for all of their energies, you know, structured, reinforced, positive activities. And um, I think the most important thing is that it helps to build self-esteem. And we know that oftentimes self-esteem is really sort of what's is the impetus for how people sort of wind up going down sort of a, a divergent path. So I am really, I'm a big supporter. I love this program, you know, and I think it also helps to address the very issues that lead to recidivism. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm pretty smart and I know that everybody got an applause that said this program should be um, not only in expanded, but funding should be increased. So I'm saying funding should be increased. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really not one of those council members that have to get applause, but, um, but I, I wanted to know, um, do you have a wait list and, um, you know, uh, do you have people who are like, who would really like to um, participate? Can you accommodate all of the people who want to participate in the program? Um, and is there, um, are you planning to expand the program and have you factored that into your budget requests? Let's do a two-parter. We'll start uh, over at Carnegie. Um, so some of the programs have had a slight wait list, but what we've done also was some participants who want to participate in the NEON program, but they're not able to do it for, for scheduling reasons or what have you. Uh, the great thing is about being Carnegie is that we have programs on site that they can also be involved in. They don't have to be system involved at all. They can be in that age range, That's but just being able to connect them with, like you said, other opportunities in that space. Great. And um, I think the important question is, um, have you, are you planning to expand? And if so, have you factored that into your budget request? Well, the, the, we're always wanting to do more. So basically the way it works, the more money there is, the more we do. The, okay. less it, the structure remains, you know, but right, the, it, it's, it's all depend, it's scalable up depending on the funds that come in, right? That's exactly right. That you can, that, you can demonstrate need for more funding. That's really like my question. Demonstrate need? Um, there's, the thing is that there's always the need, right? It, the, the, the issue is at what scale do we, do we meet that need, right? Um, so, yeah. I mean, I would also add that the, you know, the, the individual member support has helped us direct specific projects in uh, those council members' communities. And broadly, uh, with more funding, we're able to, uh, to uh, have more of the invited opportunities of more of these competitions where those local stakeholders are picking artists and arts organizations from their communities to do these projects with their, uh, with their local residents. It's kind of, it's, it's that simple. Um, and it's and uh, and it is year by year. We are you know we are aggressively hitting foundations trying to get support for this, um, and the administration's been you know an, a, a great partner in setting it up. And you know we had that early money from uh, the Soros money, you know, uh, and uh, the Open Society money, and um, and uh, so we are you know uh, this this does not exist without the, the ongoing support. But it is a, it is a fraction it, it, uh, of, uh, it is spending to make uh, these neons effective and, and it's a very effective use of public dollars. So I, I wanna say thank you for what you're doing and um, it's really great that you have um, staff that have insight 
and vision, you know, and that they make it um, not only a very good and viable program, but they make it fun and, you know, that everybody's developing marketable skills. I mean, it's a win-win. It's a um, and uh, I want to say thank you to all that are participating in the program. And I love my program on Staten Island. <laughs> Shaolin, <laughs> Shaolin in the house. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we've also now broken the record for open breakouts of applause <laughs> in a hearing, and the pressure is on, uh, but she will deliver, because Councilmember Rivera is a rock star in the council. Uh, I just wanted to add one other thing, Councilmember Rivera. First of all, uh, Bill Alatrice is taking this all so seriously. He has broken out the light. Um, uh, so, game on. <laughs> And <laughs> with that, I just wanted to say one thing. With the funding, right, let's take this energy and this real positive spirit. I spoke with Commissioner Finkel Pearl yesterday. He loves this program too, right? Who doesn't love this program? Everybody loves this program. But let's take the energy and the positivity and, and, and get some increase in funding for the program. Wait, that, the, right? Don't step on my line. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you like what I just said, only clap when Councilman Rivera says it. Okay. <laughs> but, but seriously, right, we can all together, I think, collectively agree that this is something that deserves more support. So with that, I want to call on Councilmember Rivera. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer. And yes, I think that funding for this program should be increased. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I, I just want to say how important I think criminal justice reform and alternative to incarceration and probation and how important this is. Um, this is, you clearly have successes and you have built this comprehensive arts program that I think is absolutely incredible. And I think when we talk about the arts and how it touches our lives, case in point, you can become a council member, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so with, with that, I want to ask, you know, when you have your first interaction with the criminal justice system, and particularly if you're a person of color, as successful as you might get through a certain program, you also do have, you know, kind of preconceived notions and experiences that are going to inform kind of your perception of the entire system, most likely for the rest of your life. And so when we talk about arts, I think that arts and activism go so, so hand in hand. And I wonder whether there's a, a component of the program that maybe I missed or whether through development you'll be talking about how to link some of the program participants to like social justice campaigns or even working with local elected officials because I would love an artist in my office who is participating in this program but who also wants to do things like you know funky stuff on Instagram and take cool pictures and think about campaigns on something on a hyper local level. Is that something that you all have considered? I think you just uh gave uh, Neon Arts um, 2.0 uh, for us. Uh, we have not uh, officially done that, but I think that that's exactly a growth path uh, for all of this. A, a lot of um, the, the projects, some of the projects do have an activism component to it. Um, certainly a lot of the pr projects that are community focused, let's say when they've done mural projects or you know different things, those absolutely have a, a, a process, but there, we haven't yet you know, uh, thought about it, and, and it's definitely worth doing, a particular strand of projects around social justice and, and um, other things. So, so I think um, our animation projects, uh, the, the animation project which you'll be hearing from, um, they've done a lot of PSAs, for example, um, and they do a lot, a lot of the work they do is to influence peer thinking towards a more positive, you know, uh, to, to be more positive and, and deal with a lot of the things that the teenagers deal with, like peer pressure and, you know, uh, a couple other things. Um, so, so you'll hear more from them, but, but it may be worthwhile just naming it, you know, as opposed to just letting it happen organically. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, Just I, I, a quick add on to that, that um, uh, one of the points that, one of the places where Carnegie Hall was directly in that space in partnership 
with, uh, with DOP uh, was our, our 60s festival last year, which really focused on, uh, on the protest movements um, of the period and empowerment um, uh, of, the, of, of the period. And we did a, um, a major project um, in Stern Auditorium in our main stage, a uh, time like this, Music for Change, uh, as part of the, the of the 60s festival, uh, and Neon Arts participants, as well as participants in a number of our uh, of our youth uh, youth and youth justice programs um, uh, with ACS, kind of a, and a number of these participants uh, composed their own uh, renditions, their own music, their own original music, um, on the theme of protest and social change, uh, and performed it on our stage. Uh, so it's a, kind of it's a way that we have thought about in you know in, in last year's season. Um, uh, we spoke uh, the the issue that you spoke to, but but that said, we love the idea of you know how do we engage these young people um, uh, in how how are these arts projects a pathway to civic engagement and in fact our neon inspires project which is associated with uh, with Neon Arts is where uh, the, the young participants have a chance to meet inspirational young leaders and see how there are path pathways forward. So, uh, so the work together has provided some, some of that work, but we, we'd love to think about how we could do more together. Thank you. And I'd, and I'd love to be supportive. I think, right, informed experiences are the way you change something for, for the better. And, you know, hopefully we'll, there'll be city council members one day as well. Um, so I would love to help, and, and I think it's a great program, and, um, and thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I um, will forego the rest of my questions, because I think we have a lot of folks here who want to also share their experiences with us, so we want to get them up. Um, we're actually the next panel. We have a, f a number of panels. We're going to have the next one uh, come up that actually we're going to ask participants to, from the folks that signed up who, who are, I think are participants to come up and tell their stories as well. We wanted to get them up so that we could hear from people who are directly affected by it. And so um, we'll do that. And because we have a lot of panels, and we are going to ask for two minutes. And we are going to probably hold tight on the two minutes. And if we have questions, we'll ask them. So I'm sorry if you have three minutes or four minutes of material, but we're going to try to keep it so we can hear as many stories as we can. So. Thank you to the panelists here, and thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, thank, you. thank you. So our first panel up is going to be uh, Yasmin Lancaster, Dylan Henry, Danny Cross, and Tamara Williams. If you can come on up. Just give us one second. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your patience. Um, we'll get, uh, we'll start, which I guess we can start from over here and go this way. Um, we'll, as I said, we do want to keep it to two minutes because we have a lot of folks who are here who want to tell their stories as well. So we'll, you can give us written testimony and we'll read through it if it's longer than two minutes, but otherwise you will hear, you'll hear the clock and you can finish, obviously finish your thought, but we'd love to be able to answer, ask some questions and get to folks as well. But thank you for being here and we have a number of panels that uh, we'll be calling up afterwards. So thank you, you can, you can are you, you ready? Okay. Yeah, just make sure you turn the microphone on. Thanks. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Yasmeen Lancaster. Um, this is my testimony. Art is our common humanity, is our birthright. It's the universal language that connects all of us to one another. I'm a writer, poet, and filmmaker, and became involved with Free Verse as an intern with a community-based organization, Sobro in the Bronx. I was in a probation center on 161st Street helping our organization recruit youth to get their GEDs and begin their academic life. However, writing was a passion of mine. I've been writing since I was a child, so when I was asked what I'd like to participate in a writing group that meets at a probation center every Thursday, I was not only intrigued by this novel concept, but I welcomed it because one thing that is true of all writers, besides having a fetish for pens, is we are forever in search for the one that writes smoothest without hesitation, so our thoughts will never be interrupted by a leaky pen 
but we're also looking for a community to belong to. And Freeverse provided that for me and has continued to for six years. I can speak about how, because of Freeverse, my poetry has been published in a Bronx Times newspaper. I've been asked to be a guest at the Open Program, a traveling theater group located in Pisa, Italy, this past summer. However, to me, the true value of free verse is a community that it helps to foster, create, and maintain through the art of poetry in the midst of a probation center. Rare is an individual that has never made a mistake. I have yet to meet one, and probation is a physical location where you get the individual support you need to amend your life and take a critical look at your choices. And that being said, probation is focused on the individual. However, human beings, we are communal by nature. We are born into families, and we are part of the community. We do live in isolation, and we thrive with best when we are connected. Free versus greatest achievement is that it allows individuals to stay connected, to be held accountable by those who see them not only as someone who has made a mistake, but also a budding artist, a poet, a writer, someone who has something to say, and whose voices will not only be heard, but affirmed by a community. The open mic acts as a space to share old hurts, new triumphs, and victories of the spirit. It's a testament to free verse and a community that is fostered. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. It's community that's fostered that folks come back after no longer being on probation. They come back to help someone else find their voice, to encourage them, to give them the microphone and be affirmed. In America, that's increasingly become more divided, in America in which folks are more engaged with their smartphones than a the person they're sitting across to during dinner, free verse acts as a beacon in society to remind us all that the value of community is one that should be preserved and that art is forever reaffirming our humanity wherever that art may be found. Freeverse should be funded, it needs to be funded, so that the art can maintain itself, whether it be a Broadway show or a probation center. Thank you so much for listening. <clears throat> Hello everybody, I'm Dylan, and I'm one of the Neon participants, and I first started as Fame Airbrush with Danny, and uh, I just wanted to say, it was a great experience on being an entrepreneurship. Um, first it was a hobby, and then Danny uh, told me how to make it into a job. And uh, af after I did that, um, I started photography with Chelsea, What was also was a great experience. First I started as a student, now I'm a teacher at 510 Gates Avenue. Um, we we be um, running the program for four to six, and uh, I just wanted to say that um, we need more people to experience more than just New York. So it's a great opportunity for not only people that's on probation, but people that's like um, I'm type nervous so. Um, not only people that's on probation, but people that's in the community who, who like, who's scared to come outside their neighborhood because they're not able to fit in with their peers. So this is like a new beginning where uh, you could reinvent yourself on what you're trying to do next. You know, um, we need. We need this because I'm trying to find the right word. Um, yeah, we need this opportunity because um, because It's, it's hard to get it out. Um, let me uh, say it in a different way. So um, we need this opportunity because we don't need no more kids on probation. We don't need no more kids due to um, po po police brutality. We don't need no more. Um, we need help with, with parents helping their kids find something instead of be going to the streets and looking for help. Um, we we like uh, neighborhood watch, so yeah, and, and that's it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
So it's always the people who say they're a little bit nervous who give the best testimony. <laughs> uh, that was great. Uh, it was really powerful what you said. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good afternoon. My name is Daniel Cross, and I'm the founder of Project Fame. Um, I met Neon Arts and started doing workshops in Jamaica, Queens in 2014. And I quickly spread through every borough in Brooklyn, Staten Island, Harlem, and the Bronx. Um, we teach entrepreneur workshops as far as visual arts, where we teach students that you could take your creative ideas and put them onto a t-shirt and actually sell it and make a profit. Art saved my life growing up. Um, I had no direction. I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I started creating t-shirts for myself. And through Neon Arts, I was actually able to take my teaching career to a whole other level. Um, it's like a, trade, like a creative trade school across New York City where if one of my students likes cooking, he could go to Harlem. If he wants to make beats, he could go to Queens. It's just a total networking opportunity for anybody. So if you walk through the door, we have a program that you have to be interested in because we have so much to offer. Um, and it's good to see somebody um, that can make a living off of something that they have a passion about. So I never thought I could make a living being an artist. It was a struggle. I never gave up. And it's been over a decade. And I'm just here to show young people that if you have a passion for anything in life, you could do it. Um, the sky is the limit. So whatever your dream is, your goal is, we're here to encourage them to pursue it. Our workshops are really hands-on entrepreneurship programs where we're showing you how to market yourself, how to use social media, how to set up on the weekends, how to come up with a business plan. And we coach students along the way and very proud of everybody so far. Did you guys make our t-shirts? Yes, we did. Those are awesome. Uh, best t-shirts ever. <laughs> you didn't get one? <laughs> Carlina Rivera, R-I-V-E-R-A. Small or medium? <laughs> what did you say, medium? Medium. Oh, got it. And because uh, 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 Council Member Gibson, Vanessa Gibson, who just joined us, uh, is a big supporter of the program and has one of those amazing t-shirts, uh, as well as Council Member Powers and I. So. You may have to make a few more t-shirts to keep the council members Just let happy, me know. but. Hi, good afternoon. Um, uh, my name is, is Tamara C. Williams, and I'm the founder of, of Music Beyond Measure. And uh, like Danny, uh, we, we started in 2014 with, with the Neon Arts. And at the time that my organization was started, we, uh, uh, Neon Arts was, I consider a home base because uh, my project was theoretical at that point because I had just founded the, the, the organization in 2013. So we were able to, to do uh, a live music project um, through, 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 through a Neon Arts uh, in the South Bronx. And um, it was great being selected in that first round because I feel like there was a, a standard that was set that continues to be met and, and, and exceeded as, as each project goes forward. Uh, what my organization does is we, we create arts recovery programs for trauma survivors. Long story short, we, um, we try to get, get to the root of the reasons why people end up in the, the justice system. Uh, we, we have those conversations about trauma. We, we have those conversations about um, you know, domestic violence, sexual assault, abuse, uh, gang violence, everything. Um, but, but those conversations happen through songwriting uh, and, and, and we partner the participants with professional musicians to give them, uh, n n number one, to, to remind them that they have a voice. Uh, and and, and uh, they create the most amazing art because it is from the soul and, and it's from the heart. Um, one thing I can say, you know, like, like Danny and, you know, and also like, um, like us, so, some other testimony here, uh, the reasons why I started this organization was because I went through so much trauma as a child. And once I found my way out, which took 25 years of my life, uh, it was necessary. It was, it, it was imperative for me to share that with, with other people. And the value that Neon Arts brings to, for, wow, the two minutes already. <laughs> the value that, that, that a Neon Arts brings to, to uh, probation clients, I mean, uh, I, 
I, I actually have an idea for, for uh, Neon Arts 2.0, and it kind of goes off of what, you know, what, you're, what this young man was saying here. Um, we need to get to children before they get in probation. And as powerful as these programs are, we need to use them to get into the neighborhoods and the schools so that we can start these conversations prior to anything happening and, and really equip these, these schools and equip these students, equip parents. They need tools that are going to actively engage them and, and, and that teach them what trauma is and how to prevent it and, and how to connect to resources within their communities. And all of these conversations can take place through the arts. It, it, it makes it easier to have those talks. All right, so thank you. Thank you, I want to say thank you to all of you for being here, being patient with us and telling your stories. We, uh, we're going to call another panel up but, um, and, and, to, and to hear from more folks who've been involved in it. And, and I just want to say thank you. you guys, your stories are really important. You guys tell the, the human part of this story that where I think so, so much of us are very interested in hearing. Yeah, yeah and I, I wanted to just, I know Councilmember Gibson, who is, I say, a very, very big supporter and one of your best supporters in the council for NEON. I know you want to say a couple words as well. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you to our chair, Keith Powers, and our chair, Jimmy Van Bramer. I am just really excited. I'm sharing a hearing next door, so that's why I'm late. Apologies. But um, I heard all this clapping, and I'm like, what's going on across the hall? Let me come over and, and just really thank all of you. And our commissioner of the Department of Probation, um, Anna Bermudez, has been phenomenal. Carnegie Hall has been phenomenal. The Young Men's Initiative. Um, just so many incredible partners that really get it. And we at the City Council often say we use arts as a catalyst for change. We want to make sure that we transform the lives of young people, whether they're involved with the criminal justice system or not. But obviously, we want to get them, as you said, before they enter the system. And representing a district in the South and the West Bronx, I know all too well how important arts is. I often say our young people need a first chance because they've never been given a first chance. We say second chance, they need a first chance. And using art as a form of expression, as a safe haven, for many of our young people as a place to go and be themselves without any judgment, without anyone telling them anything negative. Positivity, love, support. That's exactly what, for me, South Bronx Neon has done. And I've watched this program grow. I have been a part of its, you know, uh, involvement in the community, and I am so proud. When I see these young people in action, when I hear their stories, we all have a story. We all have a testimony. But I often tell tell my young people in the Bronx that your circumstance should not define who you are. And it's not who you are unless you allow it to be who you are. And that's where we all come in. Because so many young people are crying out for guidance and direction and love, and they don't know where. And oftentimes, we don't get them until they're in central booking right, until they're before a judge and I get a call from a mom, I need help, my son's at Central Booking. And that happens far too often. And so I agree, and what this program for me means is it means looking at it from a different perspective, from a different lens. So not just the traditional organizations and not just the traditional conventional way of thinking. We have to meet young people where they are, talk to them in the streets, because a lot of times, you know, they're just as afraid of us, right, as we sometimes are afraid of them. And we have to bridge that gap and we have to get over those insecurities and make sure that we are reaching young people where they are. So I am a big fan of talking to you at the subway station, at the bus stop, at the bodega, the beauty shop, the beauty, you know, the beauty salon, the barber shop, because these are the places where young people are. And it's not just schools and other places, but community centers, churches, the faith-based institutions. For me, that's what it is, and it's about taking it to the next level. So I applaud all of you, our participants from all of the NEONs, specifically South Bronx, so we've got to shout out the Bronx. But really, I'm so thankful. I am thankful, and we need all of you to really be ambassadors, because not every young person in New York City knows what the NEON program is about. And so we want to encourage them, we want to empower them, and talk to them about what we're offering, what we're doing, spoken word, you know, artists, music, 
whatever form of expression it is, we want them to understand we have an open and a welcoming door. And I know that's what this program speaks to. The public-private partnership, the recognition that we're all in this together is really a powerful message. And so I commend you, I thank you all profusely for what you have done, and I look forward to working with my colleagues in the new year. We have a new budget year coming up, and we are excited because our speaker, Corey Johnson, is truly a supporter and a champion of the arts and culture and the intersection, and we will continue to make sure that we work with you and we certainly walk with all of you. So I thank you. Thank you to our commissioner. Thank you to all the young people and participants. Also, a shout out to Kate Spaulding, because she's amazing. And, and really, everyone, really thank you for your work. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to interrupt. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I love the fact that our hearing has created a huge ruckus so that finance is wondering, where's all that cheering come from? Uh, it's us. Uh, Dylan, it looked like maybe you wanted to offer a comment. Yeah, I also want to say um, it, about neon photography, this is a good thing to do because most of the kids that's in middle school and high school, they don't have after school pro programs anymore. So this is basically something to do when these kids have nothing to do. So this is like, you know, figurative speech. So like they open-minded and this is, you know, most of the kids have problems at home. So this is like form of expression. So that's all I wanted to say. That's a lot. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask you a question because when I first uh, got here today, I saw you working with our photographer, Bill Alatrice, right? You were doing a little photography, but then you're also part of Project Fame as well, or you started that way? Yes, I first started with uh, Project Fame with Danny first, mm -hmm. and then uh, I got another opportunity working with Chelsea, which is better for me because now I get to explore on my page for um, my t-shirts now. I wanted to create a clothing line. So, wow. yeah, I'm killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. So I, I just had a sense, you have a lot to say, Dylan. Yes. I'm not nervous no more. That's right. <laughs> See that? That's, that's great, because it takes a lot of courage to come to the City Hall and testify, and, and maybe we all start off a little bit nervous, even us council members, and then after a while, you can't really shut us up, you know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, congratulations to all of you, uh, and for you for sharing your story uh, as well, of the childhood trauma and the early trauma that you uh, experienced. But all of you, thank you so much. It's really, really powerful that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to call up uh, a few more folks. Um, uh, and uh, Andre Whitehead, Brian Austin, uh, Lindo Sylvester, and Kenneth Swindell. If you can come on up. Thank you, thanks for being here and thanks for your patience. Um, we can start from this side this time and uh, the same thing, we'll have two minutes. Of course, finish your thought if you are in the middle of making a thought and then if we have questions, we'll ask them afterwards. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, oh, press it Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Lena Sylvester and um, I'm the recruiter for the animation project. I'm going to give you, um, you know, some information about how I got here today at the Animation Project. So um, I was a former probation client. I was on probation for three years at the, J at the Jamaica Queens Neon. And um, I, my probation officer ended up referring me to a program called the Young Adult Success Corp. And um, I decided to sign up for the program. I didn't really want to, but um, I ended up going for it. And I got called and had to attend an orientation the next week. And when I got there, I got interviewed by Deldrina Peterkins, 
And um, it was a tough interview, but I got the position and had to attend another orientation where I got placed at the Jamaica Queens Neon as a recruiter for the, for the Neon Sports and Arts programs. One day I was at the Jamaica Queens Neon um, helping out and there was a stakeholders meeting and Katrina Prelo called me into the room. And uh, sitting at the table were some stakeholders and uh, Brian Austin, Meredith Dean, and Juan from the Animation Project. Katrina told me that there was a position open and that uh, I should apply for it. And I ended up applying for the position and ended up getting called for an interview for, the, for a recruiter at the Animation Project. I went in for the interview and ended up getting the position as a recruiter for the Animation Project. And since I got this job, things, um, Things that, since I got this job, um, I, I started doing things that I weren't used to, like speaking to people, and uh, I never thought probation would help me get a job, making a lot of money and doing things that I weren't used to. I developed confidence over time, and now I'm able to stand up in front of crowds with lots of people, and people look at me different now. I feel important, and I view myself as an overachiever. I set goals for myself to over overcome all of my obstacles and push myself to stay positive at all times. These are, some of the th see, these are some of the things that help me overcome challenge my um, everyday challenges. And uh, in the future, I see myself growing with the animation project and um, you know, working with them to help these young adults in our community get placements and you know, help them get jobs and you know, get them to a better place. Great, thank you. We can go next. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kenneth Swindell. Um, I'm 43, and I started with uh, Neon relatively uh, not not long ago. I think it's been about five weeks. Um, I go to the uh, the classes in Harlem, and I just wanted to say um, I think it's important uh, for a few reasons. One of them is that uh, uh, working with Chelsea Davis, she. she meet you at whatever level uh, you're at uh, when you come in um, and, and really just has a spirit of uh, forward progression kind of moving forward. Um, she's also able to cover a, a myriad of different things from technical aspects to uh, history of photography, um, how photography can be uh, applied in just, you know, in the economy and, and different photojournalism ventures that, you know, just different avenues that you may be able to take it in a professional stance. Um, I think my favorite uh, experience thus far has definitely been, um, you know, one minute you're in a, a classroom in Harlem and then, uh, you know, Chelsea's shoving a camera in your hand and you're photographing uh, the uh, lead piano for the New York Philharmonic at like a private venue in 57th Street. Um, so I've definitely started, you know, it, it, it keeps your wheels turning. Um, it's good to be around other creative people. Uh, that inspiration is kind of priceless for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, it definitely, uh, just has me thinking in terms of how I can take my craft to the next level or adopt other skill sets that I can apply to my professional life. Um, so yeah, I'm very grateful for Neon. I think funding should definitely continue and be increased. Um, I think that's about it though. Yeah, for me. All right. You two nailed it coming in under two minutes, I just want to <laughs> say. Uh, very, very hard to do. Um, is is the, the mysterious but often talked about Chelsea in the room? She Where is, is Chelsea? There she is. Ah. <laughs> Talking about her. Everyone keeps talking about you in such amazing ways. So as you said that, I was like, boy, I hope she's in the room to hear all these people saying such nice things about you. So thank you. <laughs> we like to recognize if those like Bill who are sometimes behind the camera, behind the scenes as well. Uh, thank you. You're next. I'm going to go out just a few seconds over my two minutes just to break their record. <laughs> So I'm Brian Austin, the founder and executive director of the Animation Project, otherwise known as TAP. 
Ten years ago, I created TAP, a program where young adults come together in a therapeutic setting to learn state-of-the-art computer animation software to tell their stories. The resulting animations are screened publicly and shared on social media. Early on in our work, we partnered with the New York City Department of Probation, enabling us to serve hundreds of young, adult, young adults in family court. With the establishment of the NEON sites, and specifically NEON Arts, this partnership expanded, allowing us to reach countless underserved New Yorkers in all five boroughs. Pointedly, this partnership now includes the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. In 2017, we established the Made in New York Animation Project. Together, we currently serve 2,000 young New Yorkers and host paid interns in our workforce development program. Our industry partners include Blue Sky Studios, Avalanche Studios, Nickelodeon, Take-Two Interactive, The Mill, and many others. One of the most exciting areas of our work with young probationers is to witness them come to life when asked to tell their own stories. In many, in many settings, young adults are not encouraged to express their full contradictory selves. Pull up your pants, take off your hat, don't curse, turn it down, keep it moving. These are all well-intentioned and well-meaning refrains directed, sometimes loudly, at youth. Social order is, of course, necessary. But with youth development as our goal, young adults need a space to develop and share their ideas. This is why TAP's first mandate is to listen. Our therapists begin each group with, what story do you want to tell? When I tell people about TAP's work, I often find myself having to emphasize that, yes, the Department of Probation is our partner. Just a little more. It, it, it deserves to be better known that probation is in the business of offering opportunities for growth. This holds true not only for the individuals it serves, but is equally true for its partners. The New York City Department of Probation has been essential in enabling TAP to bring our unique di direct service programming to thousands of young adults, ensuring that their stories are heard, that even the most disadvantaged in our city have access to technology, thereby placing sustainable jobs within their reach. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, hello, my name is Andre Whitehead, and I'm a neon photographer. Um, I've been working with Chelsea for a few months, and um, I thank her every chance I get for this opportunity to uh, um, express myself in photography. Um, I'm also currently on probation. My probation officer is P.O. Georges. And um, uh, since, uh, since I've uh, been in the class, uh, I've, I've, it, Chelsea has provided uh, numerous opportunities for me to uh, like uh, express myself and take photos at different events, such as the the Thanksgiving Day Parade, um, uh, uh, events with the uh, Park Avenue Pianos, um, this city city council uh, meetings, this press conference last Tuesday, um, where I, where I met the commissioner. It was uh, a year ago. My life wasn't in in this. You know, I wasn't in this state of mind. My life was different, and and now I have the opportunity to be more, way more positive than I've ever been, and I see the progress in it, and I, and I'm I'm more confident, you know, and, and being successful in a positive way. Um, I I thank you. I thank you all here for uh, giving the youth this opportunity. Um, throughout the class, this is is. It's just I'm networking, networking with different artists is making me more creative, you know, and making me more open to ideas. And it's just a beautiful experience. And, uh, and uh, I look forward to looking, you know, to doing more with Neon Photographers. Thank you. So th thank you for those stories. And uh, you can tell about the inspiration and and, um, and how the programs are working. And I give credit to a lot of people who are in this room for making that happen. Um, and, and thank you for those stories. I also just want to say, I, I actually criticized another agency at one point for doing this at the last hearing. So I want to commend the Department of Probation for staying here and listening to these testimonies and these stories. Often the administration comes and they leave after they have to do their part. Not to say they may have to go at some point, but um, it is actually 
uh, respect that they give to hear all of you, uh, your stories as well. I wanna thank the commissioner for staying and her team for being here to listen to the, to the stories and not just flee after they say they're part of, uh, of uh, have, have their part of it. I think that is worth celebrating as well because we often don't see that. So thank you, I'm gonna head back to um, Somehow that's not surprising though because Commissioner Bermudez, I feel like would be rather be nowhere else than right here at this moment, right? And listening to this testimony. So uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. So is it, uh, is it Lindo? It's Lyndon. Right? What's that? It's Lyndon Sylvester. Linda? Yes, Sylvester. Sylvester. Yes. Right. What's that? Ah, Lyndon, yes, got yes. it. <laughs> I was reading it off the page. Um, so I was struck by some of the things that you said. Uh, and I loved it when you described yourself as an overachiever uh, and you talked about your confidence because in some ways I feel like I'm an overachiever. Uh, I come from a very, very, you know, working class family, right? Uh, and uh, neither of my parents graduated from high school and I was the first person in my family to go to college. And, you know, I, I didn't know how I was going to make it in my life at various times. I only knew that I had ambition and that somehow I was going to do it, right? And I see that in you, right? The way you talk about speaking in front of big crowds of people and having this confidence and carrying yourself in a different way. So I just wanna say, I expect very big things from you. Um, maybe you're gonna run for political office one day <laughs> and be president of the United States of America. <laughs> Would you like to run in two years? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to. <laughs> There may be an opportunity. <laughs> um, and and, um, and uh, I think it's uh, Kenneth, right? Uh, I, I just wanted to say too, I loved it when you said uh, that being surrounded by other creative people, right? I may be paraphrasing, but that was inspirational to you. And I think that's also part of the beauty of this program is that when uh, someone who is creative and wants to create is, is surrounded by other creative people. It drives everyone around in that, in that network to do great things. And you mentioned networking, right? Which is all part of the same thing. So uh, I just wanted to uh, say thank you and uh, encourage all of you to keep being ambitious, right? And, to, uh, and to, uh, to do whatever it is you wanna do because you can do it. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you, thanks so much. We're gonna call up our next panel of four. Uh, we're gonna call up uh, Taquan Spencer, George Warwick, uh, Sherry Hood, and I think it's Khalif Williams, Khalif Williams. Thank you. Uh, we could start, I think we started this on this side, if you like, sir. I'll start with yeah. Sean, you go. Damn. You got just turn Hello? the mic. Hello? Thanks. We on? All right. <sighs> Good afternoon. I'm Taekwon Spencer. I'm actually um, a mentor for East New York and Best Eye Archers. So my experience with the, with the Neon Arts, um, I've done went through the fame airbrushing. I've done, I'm doing the photography now. I, took, I actually took the class last year, and now I'm teaching it in um, Best Eye. Um, from my perspective, it's working. Like, I'm, I'm knee deep in it. I'm going, knocking on doors. And like somebody um, said in their testimony earlier, they don't have nothing to look forward to. My participants have something to look forward to Monday through Sunday. You know what I mean? So um, I'm not gonna be long, but that is, is working. The programs that y'all are coming up with is working. Um, they have something to look forward to. They have something to express themselves without being in the streets. They can come to uh, to five ten gates. They could uh, they could shoot a camera and not a gun. That's that's the that's one of the things that I try to get across to them. Like, oh, you call yourself a shooter. You now you could be really be a shooter and you could shoot these photos. So, and for me, for my personal experience, 
it's, it's had me looking at life in a different perspective. Now, as I'm walking down the street, I just don't walk down the street. I actually see different things. I see, I see things in a whole new lens, as I would say. So that's basically my testimony. Thank you. Thanks so much. Why are we on the bus from Carnegie Hall that day? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing, Council? Hello, everyone. I submitted paper in case. My name is George, and it's an honor to be here and to be able to speak concerning an issue dear to my heart. I am a free verse poet who relighted my artistic spirit to New York City DOP and the NEON program. I would like to extend my gratitude to Commissioner Bermudez and the entire DOP staff for their support and encouragement of free verse and the NEON program. Not only do I participate and instruct, but I am a client of DOP who found free verse and NEON helped change my attitude towards my involvement with the criminal justice system. Freeverse has given those without a voice the ability to speak through open mic, published magazine, and performance at Carnegie Hall. Many of those served come from neighborhoods underserved with artistic programs. Through Freeverse, I have attended events and helped with block parties in East New York, Brownsville, the South Bronx, Flushing, Rosebank, and even a Kwanzaa event in Stapleton in Councilwoman Rose's district. We have encouraged thousands of submissions to our magazine, and to watch someone react when their work is published makes it all worthwhile. I've seen clients who dreaded coming to probation and the weight it entails embrace our open mic and writing sessions. I would like to see free verse at all DOP locations, for it changes people and instills hope and is an outlet for their thoughts. In closing, I want to thank everyone for listening and hope you consider expanding our work where needed. A client told me that free verse changed his life, and I told him that he changed mine. Thank you. And for Councilman Holden, you could submit poems and artistic work to the email that's in the front page of the magazine, <laughs> just so you know. I, I pass. Thank you. I don't, I don't know if you know, he's a good graphic designer. I don't know how much of a poet he is, but we'll find out. There's an email address in the back. All right. We'll be, uh, the pressure's on now. I the guess. pressure's on. Uh, thank you for that. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll keep going. Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm P.O. Sherry Good. I'm from the Staten Island Neon Councilwoman Deborah Rose's uh, district. And I like to say I was one of the first P.O.s that came on when this program initiated. And... It's been remarkable to see kids that didn't have hope, have hope. So, oh, I can't do that, I can't make a video, I can't make a CD. Here's the microphone, let's do something. Now you have a CD, I did it. It's the aha moment that really, really counts. I think it's the holistic uh, environment that we've created. It's not just, you're in trouble, that's your worst day, let's deal with that. It's, let's look forward and see where we can go, what we can be, who are you? And they don't know. But by the time they finish some of our programming, they know. So the Neon Arts has been a wonderful program to be affiliated with. And I thank Ianna Cole, LeBrandon Smith, our stakeholders, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Khalif Williams. I'm 30 years old. I've been participating in the Neon Arts program in Bedford-Stuyvesant since October. I have a background in photography and I worked in television a long time ago and since then I've kind of like let the camera sit up and collect dust and I was really happy to find out that through the, through uh, the Neon Arts program that I could get back into uh, my what was my passion and really start to uh, achieve what I had originally set out to do. So in a, in, a, in a great way, the Neon Arts program has reignited my flame to stay great and to become great and to remain. So, and um, you know, they, they have, uh, honestly, to be, uh, this is my second time coming to City Hall, and 
this is the city hall shooting at city hall is like my favorite part of uh the neon arts is because it's the greatest city on earth and this is the office that actually runs the greatest city on earth and it's a beautiful uh, artisan created, they don't even make stuff like this anymore. And it's like a million pounds of marble in this place. And uh, it's just, it's just like a very intriguing, very like gorgeous place to shoot. So I really enjoy coming to shoot at the City Hall. And uh, I, this program has also inspired me to, to dedicate a lot of my time to to giving back and to uh, to helping to facilitate, to helping programs like this to reach the people. Because there's a big, like everyone is saying, there's a big, there's a big gap between people knowing that these outlets exist for them. And it's, it's tough to say that you have to be in trouble in order to figure it out. But through working with Chelsea and working with Neon Arts and um, the rest of these good people, um, we will definitely be using whatever resources we have available to, to spread this word and to help, to, to, to help this program, programs like this to reach more people, to catch them before they get into their situations. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I will, I will, uh, I, I will just note, and I think I speak for my colleagues, we share your affinity for the city, but also the ability to work in such a beautiful place every day to do work that's, we think, very important. Tell us when you want to come shoot photos at the City Hall. We won't pull Bill out of a job, but we <laughs> certainly, uh, maybe we will, yeah. Uh, no, but no, well, we certainly look forward to seeing uh, all the work you guys have done today and will be doing. I know, Councilman. Right? <laughs> So I just had a, a question, there's so many photographers. Have you uh, photographed Carnegie Hall? No, not yet. Not yet, Khalif has not. Yeah. You have, okay. Because that would seem like you have Dylan as well? Yeah. It would seem like a pretty incredible experience to photograph Carnegie Hall as well. Uh, so Chelsea, you seem to be able to make anything happen. <laughs> Yeah, wonderful. Um, uh, it's Khalif, right? Yes. So we have to get Khalif into Carnegie Hall to photograph it as well. Um, uh, again, just want to say thank you to uh, all of you. Um, this is one of the greatest hearings we've ever had. Uh, seriously, I've been the chair of the Cultural Affairs Committee all nine years of uh, my tenure, and we've had some really good ones. We had jazz musicians play once in the hearing. Um, uh, talking about retirements uh, of jazz musicians and how we could support jazz musicians who were uh, struggling to make ends meet after they finished their club playing days. That was pretty cool because they were playing in the hearing. But this one from like uh, an inspirational, emotional standpoint is right up there with one of the best and that's because of all of you, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, next panel, Electra Welton. Is Electra Welton here? Weston. Weston. That is a great name, Electra Weston. Thank you. Uh, Julie Define or Define? Defino. Defino. I am 0 for 2. <laughs> <laughs> Laura Setkowski. Is Laura Setkowski here? Did I call that right? 1 for 3. And it looks like Suzanne Harnett. All right. <laughs> that is the next panel. And I think we'll start with Electra, uh, who we met at the hearing last, at the press conference last yes. week, right, on the steps of City Hall. Absolutely. I'm going to, I prepared something. Uh, I want to say, first, yes, I'm Electra Weston. I'm the founder and director of the nonprofit organization, the International Child Program. I'm honored to be speaking today on behalf of the extraordinary collective work of Neon Arts, Carnegie Hall, and the New York Department of Probation. I really want to testify at what an extraordinary impact it's having on our youth. As an artist, I founded an organization because I realized how crucial it is to take our successes and our experiences, 
back into our neighborhoods to strengthen our communities. And I'd like to share one quick story of how Neon Arts has allowed me to achieve this goal. There was a brilliant young man that shined so brightly during a very, my very first Neon Arts workshop. It's called Pocket Flicks, an introduction to filmmaking with cell phones. During each session, he was extraordinarily outgoing and talented, and his presence and energy inspired others. That same young man was awarded an internship during the second grant opportunity. One day, this young man disappeared in the middle of the internship. We learned that he was incarcerated at Rikers Island on a warrant technicality. We corresponded during his incarceration, continuing to discuss his work, his important contribution to our arts collaboration, and that his internship was waiting for him when he returned. I personally went to court hearings, which went about 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., um, to speak on his behalf and to introduce letters of recommendation. After three months, I and another organization promised to follow the progress of this youth and the judge released this young man in my custody. When they uncuffed this man, it was as if I was liberated. He walked down the streets in brown prison pajamas, smiling um, and feeling free, and I was liberated. We went to eat, and I accompanied him to a men's shelter where he spent the first few weeks of his release. He immediately became active in arts in our arts programming as he was in the past as if he had never left and he continues to inspire today and we are in contact on a regular basis just to end this arts the arts empowers our society culture and economy and it creates necessary bonds and consistency for these youth and again, I passionately believe that it changed lives. It changed mine. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Julie Dufine Ah. Sorry for the, um, <laughs> it's my writing. I was writing on my hand. Um, I'm the Senior Director of Youth Justice Programs at Community Mediation Services in Jamaica, Queens, and also a chairperson for the Jamaica Neon uh, Stakeholders Committee that selects from all of these wonderful art, um, artisan art programming options. Um, I, as I stated, I work, I oversee various um, probation programs and alternative to incarceration programs and work with at-risk youth also at the Queensbridge Houses. Uh, we have another program site there. Um, and all of our participants in all of those programs have had opportunities to participate in this arts program, in the arts programming. Um, I have been in my capacity since 2012, and, and therefore have been with Neon Arts since their inception. And I've gotten to see throughout the years several young men um, and young women who have, you know, we, we first meet with these kids coming out of Rikers, coming out of court on felony convictions, um, having just been sentenced to probation, and really meeting them at their lowest of their low points in life at that time. Um, and they're not really excited about doing, they don't expect to have this type of service options available to them. Um, they expect to be in a system that is punitive and you know walking a fine line and, and that kind of thing. And it's been really, really great to see these young people grow through this programming and through their involvement in these, these different programs. Um, we have a few kids, uh, handful of kids now that have been hired through Carnegie and hired through these arts organizations. Uh, there's not a final performance that I can go to or any of these neon arts activities that I can go to that I'm not emotional watching these kids where my brain flashes back to meeting them at Rikers Island when they were angry and sad and quiet um, to seeing themselves now being so expressive and so um, loving life and having goals and having plans and so it's been something that has been great for my team to see really just the growth and um, promise that these young people now have, and I do attribute that, that to their participation in Neon Arts. So I thank you for your past and continued support in this programming. Oh, yeah. Good afternoon, I'm Suzanne Harnett and I'm joined by my colleague Laura Satkowski. We work for Metis Associates, which is one of the two independent research and evaluation firms that conducted the evaluation of Neon Arts. Um, our evaluation of this program was largely qualitative and included observations, interviews, focus groups, surveys, review of attendance, and other program documentation. 
We wrote a hefty report um, about our study of the program, which I hope you will read. Um, but at least I hope you'll curl up with the executive summary at some point in the cold days ahead. Um, but today I want to speak about a key theme that emerged from the evaluation, which is engagement. Uh, by participating in Neon Arts, we found that individuals became engaged. This necessitated trying new things, taking creative risks, and opening themselves up to being vulnerable, which is exactly what the arts have the potential to do. Another thing that the arts provide is an opportunity to equalize the playing field. We observe probation officers and other adults from the community engaging in the arts with the youth and, and also taking creative risks and allowing themselves to be equally vulnerable. And what we heard and saw was that this process was transformative for all groups involved. In fact, what we found was that the key themes that emerged from the evaluation were evident for all participant groups. It is clear that creative risk taking is an incredibly empowering thing when it takes place in a community of trust and respect. As Commissioner Bermudez mentioned earlier, we were lucky enough to work with a youth advisory group that helped to design evaluation tools and processes. In a parallel way to the creative risks that participants were taking in the program, this process also took us out of our comfort zone and has led to new directions in our work. In summary, we just want to say that developing programming with the idea that we're going to change uh, just what just the participant group um, and just the youth participants is an antiquated idea. We're always being changed by each other. Just like a math equation, if you make changes to one side, you'll, ma you'll have to make changes to the other side. And that's the beauty of Neon Arts, because it's designed with this very idea in mind. The playing field is equalized, and all participants, including youth, adults, probation officers, artists, and even evaluators, were encouraged to engage, take creative risks, and to grow. And I'd also just want to note that in my experience as an evaluator, this program operates through a unique set of partnerships and serves as an excellent model for replication in other locations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, I just want to say uh, your passion uh, and the emotion with which you bring to this work was really felt, and I really deeply appreciate that, and I know that all of you uh, feel the same way, so thank you all very, very much. Uh, the next panel, I know Shalanda Miller is here, uh, and I believe going to testify. Um, Could it be Carol McIntosh? Carl McIntosh. Carl McIntosh. Sorry about that, Carl. Bryant. Tiffany Bryant and Mansura Kanam. This time we'll start on the right with you, Shalanda. Good afternoon. Is it on? Oh, is the light on? Yes. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shalonda Miller. I am currently the co-chair of Brownsville Stakeholders Neon, and I have been a part of the Neons for about three years. Um, I was introduced to probation or to the Neon from working at Columbia University um, with a research project that we were doing with Justice Involved, Males and Females. Um, since leaving that department, that job, I am still currently holding my seat as the co-chair because I am a resident of Brownsville, been there for about 25 years by way of the Caribbean. Um, I just want to say that the NEON personally for me has been, has transformed me as a woman, as a mother, as a wife, as a student. Um, it, I am currently published in a book that you guys hold. Um, I have about four poems that I've did within the last two series. And um, it's just really helped me to click not only with my community members and the young people, but with myself, connect with myself. And I think that's, no matter how old you are, that's something that's just appreciative beyond words. Um, you can find yourself at a young age, you can find yourself at an older age. And with Neon Arts, it helps you to endure things um, that you may not think is, are possible. Um, I am a great supporter of Neon Arts. I am 
a believer in neon arts, and I just wanna thank everyone who has anything to do with just bringing neon arts to some place like Brownsville, which I'm wearing a fame shirt um, that Danny and some other people <laughs> have put together, um, because it, it does wonders. Currently, we are doing our, um, Brownsville is in BCMS, which is Brownsville Collaborative Middle School, doing Thrive NYC with about 70 students, um, started, started November of this year and we'll be wrapping up in March. And it's just great to see these kids who sometimes don't have heat and hot water where they live at come to school because they're excited of, of putting a mural on their school wall. And, and you know, just things like that are just really encouraging. They currently just lost a student to um, cancer last week and now the mural is gonna be changed short notice because of her passing. They wanna do something to recognize Mia who passed away from, um, from leukemia last week. So I just wanna say thank you and just wanted you guys to know that Brownsville is very appreciative for Neon Arts. Hi, my name is Tiffany Bryan. I'm from the Public Theater. Um, we do not have a NEON program, but I wanted to take this opportunity to speak to both of you um, to discuss how we as a cultural institution um, do help people who are currently incarcerated and those who are formerly um, incarcerated um, on probation. Um, we do this to, through two of our programs, our mobile unit and our public works program. Our mobile unit tours um, Shakespeare productions throughout the city and we go to about seven correctional facilities um, each, each semester um, and give the people the opportunity to sh see Shakespeare. And I'll just share one quote um, from someone who attended at a correctional facility. She said, it is the first play I've ever seen as an adult and it will f not be forgotten ever. Um, additionally, we work with the Fortune Society, um, which I know you're both familiar with. Um, which helps people with reentry, um, which is obviously a great, great program, and we have the pleasure of working with David um, Rothenberg. And I will just share a quick quote um, from him. It is difficult to measure the vast impact on our men and women participating in the public theater programs. From personal experience, I see up close people have, who have been marginalized and or overlooked gaining the excitement of participating in such a creative venture. Um, and I will end on that note, but I just wanna say thank you. Um, I'm inspired by all the people who have testified today hearing the stories. Um, so I'm so glad I was able to attend. Hello, my name is Carl McIntosh. I'm a very proud neon photographer. Um, I got involved in this program because my son invited me to a, what's it, free verse here, uh, reading of poetry at his probation office. I said, what the heck? I always want to support my son in any way at all as, as he supports me. I get there and it was like, cool. It was in a church. It was next door. I didn't know I was next door. It was in the church. It was cool. They read a little poetry. Just grooving it. Nice, cool little thing. And I see a little lady in the corner talking about that she went to get us in photography. I said, oh, I have a degree in cinema many years ago. I'm 63 from USC. And I got, then got MBA and went into that world and did quite well and enjoyed that, but I always had an edging in my mind, yeah, it touched my creative measure. So I got involved in the program. Changed my life and the dynamics between myself and my son, okay? My son's a very strong man, okay? He's very strong intellectually. And uh, you know, when you're 63, of 30 years old, son, you become different worlds, right? So where we might have difference in who's the best basketball player or what's consistent with things, there's always strong differences, perhaps, which I encouraged through my whole life. You know, sometimes it became too, yeah, you know? Photography, don't argue about nothing. You can't argue about a picture. Because cause we argue about a picture, you say, oh no, from this perspective, I think the artist, may, but it's a totally different concept. So it became a, a conduit of communication between myself and him become so powerful, okay? It changed my life, okay? It's changed his life too, okay? He might not be, he's as shy as he might think, but. So for example, I first said my son's brilliant, okay? I'm sorry for talking to my son, okay? But, so now we have a system, okay? I'm a computer uh, project manager, okay? So if I want to develop a system like MetroCard I worked on, you know, it's a long process to, from Microsoft, you gotta plan through a lot of steps, right? I saw my son go into a class that something took and create a picture that took a long process to do. You have to plan how to get there, you have to shoot the pictures. So it just became a very dynamic, 
it just changed our dynamic relationship to become very powerful, be gone really quickly. It changed the concept of the family towards him. That is very positive, though. Know. He has a son that likes to play video games, okay? He plays video games. Everybody kids like video games. He didn't want to go away to college because oh, I'm going to do good as granddad, right? So, oh, come on, I'm going to play video games in college, right? My son believed in him. That's his son, right? So my grandson. And nurtured him, okay? He's playing little video games in the room, right? All day, I said, what the heck? Let's get him out of here, right? Long story short, right around the time that he came to New York, my son became very active in his career. So much so, you know, Carnegie Hall and people that come to Carnegie Hall, a guy named Mr. Biggs or someone was there, right? Big third producer at Rock Nation. This is a true story. Listen to me now. He goes ahead. He's not a producer, what? Anyway, he goes ahead and, and he um, gets my son involved with Rock Nation, Rock, and he signed my son, right? Rock Nation signed my son as a video player. I'm quite sure that because of the energy that my son, grandson saw my son help acclimate that process. So I'm just, I'm very hyped about this. The lady was saying something about uh, community involvement. It was a little change what I was about to do. I was gonna go to PhD in business. Now I'm gonna get more involved in activism. I'm very interested in uh, exploitation. I mean, also exploitation of elderly people, young people, et cetera. So, um, from what Chelsea put into us and what we've seen with, the, with all the energy from Anna and all, it just changed my whole direction, changed the direction of my whole family, and I just want to thank you for the experience. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for staying and for letting me speak. Uh, my name is Mansoura Kanam, and I am a program teacher with the Young New Yorkers. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Young New Yorkers founder and executive director, Rachel Barnard, who couldn't be here today, who is also the current public artist in residence at the DOP. This is her testimony. Young New Yorkers uses art to bring positive systemic change to the ways that teens and young adults are prosecuted in New York's criminal legal system. We do this by providing restorative arts diversion programming as a sentencing option for young people facing charges in adult criminal court. So since 2012 to date, over 900 young people have been sentenced to make art at Young New Yorkers instead of jail or other adult sanctions. So just let that sink in. Young New Yorkers is thrilled by the NEON Arts Evaluation Report that provides strong evidence of the positive, meaningful, and sustained impact of art programming on young people and the larger communities the Department of Probation serves. As clearly shown in the report, community arts programming contributes to meaningful gains in social and emotional learning and sets up an environment in which communities can be safe and thriving. So I had three, or Rachel had three examples here, which I guess we'll cut down a little bit. Um, and the three examples were Neon in Brownsville, Neon in East New York, and Carnegie Hall's Create Justice. We're gonna just talk about the Neon, uh, the Young New Yorkers and Neon Brownsville program. Young New Yorkers ran a restorative arts programming around gun violence in Brownsville. At the completion of this program, the young people who participated, over half of whom were on probation, realized a public art installation called Love Letters to Brownsville. In, front, in the front garden of 444 Thomas Boylan Street, facing the local 72nd police precinct. 73rd, sorry. In Love Letters to Brownsville, 400 white roses were weaved to form a sculpture that read the word trust. Guests were invited to write a letter to the Brownsville on bright pink tags. Guests then met with the young artist attending the rose sculpture and exchanged their love letter to Brownsville for a white rose, a gift from the young people to their community. Slowly, the trust sculpture transformed from white roses to pink love letters swaying in the wind. Um, and then there are two other examples which I'll skip over. So in all of these projects, young youth used art to lead the conversation around criminal legal issues that impacted them and sought to create change by creating positive new connections between themselves and those with the discretionary power within the criminal legal system. Um, and the second part, which will be really quick, is on PAIR. In addition to founding Young New Yorkers, I am also currently the Department of Probation's Public Art in Residence, or PAIR. My experience with working as an artist with the DOP leadership has continued to impress me with their commitment to create safe and thriving communities, not only through supervision practices, but by creating supportive structures that allow individuals to move beyond difficult immediate circumstances and to become contributions to their communities. 
Um, for the residency, the Department of Probation Leadership has explicitly asked me to improve client officer relationships and develop a series of concrete interventions in collaboration with the DOP community to be staged across all five boroughs. The project is to be realized this February and will use art to center the existing wisdom of staff and clients and to create new modes of connection to lead to better staff and client relationships and in turn better case outcomes for clients, keeping more people in the community. In my experience, the DOP has shown their commitment to keeping people within their com communities and the Neon Arts program shows their courage and willingness to meet this commitment through innovative means such as the arts. The future opportunities of arts at the DOP. With the implementation of Raise the Age, the DOP is providing adjustments to adolescent offenders. Currently, this group includes 16-year-olds and starting next October, it will also include 17-year-olds. The Young New Yorkers, with our seven years of experience with providing arts programs as a sentencing option to over 900 young people ages 16 to 25, encourages the DOP to provide arts programming as an adjustment option. Young New Yorkers welcomes the opportunity to partner with the DOP on this project. In conclusion, this hearing demonstrates the DOP and the Council's commitment to exploring innovative arts-based alternatives in New York City's criminal legal system. Young New Yorkers looks forward to continuing to work with the Department of Probation to provide st statistically verified arts-based alternative sentencing program. Please do not hesitate to reach out to Rachel Barnard, the Young New Yorkers founder and executive director with any questions. Thank you, thanks so much. I just, I wanted to say thank you. I know we have to keep going because we have, we're running out of time here. Um, I'm glad you brought up the PAIR program because I don't think we had enough opportunity to talk about that and I actually had some questions about it earlier. I also wanted to say thank you to Public Theater. I did have an opportunity to see Twelfth Night. It's fantastic, it was fantastic. But also the idea that there was uh, folks, I know Fortune Society and other, other partners there as well was I think a really important part of that process. And I'll just give you a quick, um, I, I, I went to it and I saw, somebody who I think was the mailman in the uh, Twelfth Night, and I next day I went to the Fortune Society and I saw him there, and I forget his name, but he was wonderful. He was a great actor, but it also was great to see him on stage and then be able to see him the next day when I was there. So thank you for all your work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next panel, we will have Dave Johnson from Freeverse, Eric McLeod, McLeod? Uh, Frank Doty, and Serena Chandler. I gave it earlier, but I just had one. But, but I, yeah, they passed it around. Right? Okay. They got copies of the magazine already, right? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. You want one? Okay, one had to leave, thank you. So we're gonna, uh, we'll start the clock. We can start on this side. And again, we're gonna, we, we are gonna try to do two minutes a person, so if you can summarize or power, you know, paraphrase portions that might be longer. I'm sorry to do that to you, but it's, we're 3.45 and then we have one more panel. We're trying to end by four, so. Uh, and of course you could submit written testimony to us as well. So, thanks. Good afternoon and thank you. I'm Frank Doty, the Program Manager for Education and Training at Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration and also the co-chair of the bed Neon. It's been my pleasure to have been a member of the bed Stakeholders Group since its inception in 2012. Given my years with Neon, I've also been able to be part of the exciting Neon Arts Program since it started. My initial interest in seeing arts programs embedded in the work of community engagement for individuals on probation came from my years in the education program at Rikers Island. As assistant principal and later principal, I had the opportunity to set aside budget for the arts programming and to see the positive impact it had on our students. I knew the Department of Probation was on the right track with Neon Arts, and I was eager to support it and be involved. When the applications opened in New York City, which is rich in the arts and, the art and artists, the stakeholders and the youth have a wide choice of artists and art forms to select from. In bed Stive, we've had spoken word artists, theater productions, visual artists, airbrush artists, animation, and photography. Our youth and community have enjoyed and, and engaged and benefited from all of these experiences. 
Youth have been uplifted through their engagement with the work, the artists themselves, the community in which they produce the work, the processes they go through as individuals and as members of a team, and the recognition that they receive in finales and, and um, products that come from the art experience. During the experience, they learn new skills and gain new levels of self-awareness. This is especially significant as the population often feels intimidated around taking on new tasks and embracing new experiences. The community aspect of the projects give them direct experience in the power of teamwork and collaboration. These skills are easily transferable to other aspects of their lives. Um, the, the fact that it's a community-based project I think is really significant because the community gets to see folks on probation through a different lens. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Serena Chandler and I am the co-chair for the Harlem Neon. I'd like to speak to you today about two words, challenge and evolution. When I was a little girl growing up in Saratoga Springs, New York, I was a member of the 4-H, the girls club, and on the YMCA swim team. I was fortunate that both my parents worked and were able to afford the $50 fee for me to join the YMCA and have access to programs that allowed me to express myself artistically. I filled my parents' house with potholders and ashtrays. As I became a woman, a wife, and a mother, my, my interests evolved. And I understood that my children's challenges went beyond knickknacks and sports. Their challenges were the challenges of my youth evolved. Now that I'm a grandmother and a great grandmother, I see yet more evolution in the challenges facing our youth today and the dangers lurking and lying in wait for them. As a child growing up, probation was a bad word. It meant that you were in trouble. You were a bad kid. You were on the wrong path. You, were, you had no future other than the criminal justice system. But probation has evolved and partnered with Carnegie Hall to create the Neighborhood Opportunity Networks and the stakeholder groups. The NEON programs are free and they are, in fact, enriching our lives of the youth and our communities and creating opportunities for the young people to express themselves artistically through culinary arts, animation, spoken word, and other art programs. And this will lead to continued education and employment opportunities. I would like to issue a challenge to everyone here Seek out your neon. Go to those monthly meetings. Invite the youth and your community leaders and your community-based organizations. Join the stakeholder groups and evolve with us. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, city council members. Thank you for your time today. Uh, I want to thank Anna Bermudez and the DOP staff, uh, the Neon Art staff, and everyone at Carnegie Hall uh, for giving me this opportunity. My name is Dave Johnson. I'm a poet and playwright. Uh, I've served the New York City Department of Probation for a little over seven years as poet in residence, and I'm the founder and creator of Free Verse Writing Program. I think everybody got a copy. Thank you for the, all the kind remarks about the magazine. And as George said earlier, uh, it's a magazine that's open to everyone. It's open to the community. Uh, it's open to our staff, everyone. When you read this magazine, you'll see there are no titles. So you'll see side-by-side -side clients and their probation officers uh, and professional poets all in the same magazine. This last uh, magazine you'll see, we had over a 1,000 uh, submissions to this, to this journal. Uh, when we started, I just simply went into the program or went into the waiting room and would ask people if they wanted to write a poem. You can imagine they looked at me as if I was insane. Uh, but that quickly changed as we, uh, as we started to develop. Uh, born and bred and living in the heart of the waiting room in the South Bronx, 
where clients are checking in with their officers. Freeverse solicits uh, for the magazine. Um, and then we also created a, uh, a paid writing apprenticeship program where, where the young people are employed right there in the waiting room to teach others how to read and write poems as well. We host weekly open mics and workshops, numerous public events that invite DOP clients, officers, staff, professional writers and artists all to the community together. Um, I have, I sent this around so I know you have copies of it, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that in direct line with the council's mission and vision of reform in the social justice system, Freeverse seeks to create spaces for freedom of expression and places for economic opportunity that promote democracy and human achievement through the written word. Our strategy is not only to create an arts program, but we are a conduit for creating value for court-involved clients and the community and to serve the city. We propose to build on our existing publishing house and working artist program that produces original work, generates educational material for literacy at all levels, and that creates more jobs for Department of Probation clients and court-involved youth that will serve all social service agencies and nonprofits throughout the city. Freeverse has been able to extend their reach beyond DOP by employing DOP clients with other agencies and nonprofits. Uh, presently, we are, all, as, as we all are looking for more funding, we were generously allotted a funding to expand through the DCLA grant. Thank you very much for that, which was allotted to us, uh, which, which allowed us to hire eight additional clients and put them to work between January and June throughout the city. Uh, George, who spoke to you earlier, was one of those clients, and he hired three more clients in the Staten Island uh, branch of the NEON. Uh, Freeverse has a grand plan, and seven years ago, there were very few people that I proposed this idea of Freeverse to that thought it would actually work, minus Sharon Goodwin, who's right here, Assistant Commissioner. Thank you, Sharon, for all your belief in this program. But DOP gave Freeverse and me an opportunity, and we've been able to extend our work into other venues and are working with so many organizations now, some of our guys are teaching in uh, visually impaired centers for seniors, Brooklyn Public Library, adult literacy centers, and so many other places. I know we're out of time, but thank you very thank much. You. Sorry, thank you, thank you, thank you. I just wanna, I wanted to say one other thing. I noticed that uh, Mr. Johnson, I think we're, well, we're almost neighbors. And uh, in light, I was gonna say, your council member Carlina Rivera was here earlier. In addition to talking to stakeholders, to also make sure that we elevate the work that you're doing across the city council, across other elected officials too, that this is what part of today is about, but also for many folks who live in communities, they, you have elected officials too, making sure they know the work that you, that's being done and make sure that's not a forgotten part of the conversation. We talk about criminal justice or criminal justice reform as well. So thank with that, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your testimony as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay, this will be our last panel. I really thank everybody who stayed to, to the end here. We have Michael McIntosh, Sarah Ogre, Ogre? Sorry if I got that wrong. Ebony Walden and Emrose Dowdy. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Hold on, look, we're just gonna wait one second for the <laughs> other folks to get out. We you appreciate know, your enthusiasm, though. I know this is the end of it, so I wanted to give a little. <laughs> I, know, I feel it. I feel it. the final, the last lap. Okay, then we may have lost the other two along the way. They're here with us in spirit and perhaps watching online. Uh, uh, so why don't we? You can go ahead. Thank you. Okay, right, all right. First, I want to thank everybody for coming. And um, me, I have to be a living proof of a program like this. And our alternative to our incarceration is very important, especially nowadays. Um, and just to have access to certain people, places, and things. And if um, you could organically start building up these type of relationships with probation officers, not on a disciplinary level, but on a creative level, and just having these things, it really works. You know, that's the best thing that I would like to say. And um, I'm from East New York, Brooklyn, and we have been affected a lot by gun violence and then the whole cycle of it, of parents going to jail and then never coming back and things like that. And um, I have reconnected with my family on certain levels and um, just living proof. Um, 
coming from where I'm coming from, to have access to the community and people in the community to have access to these things is very important. And Neon Arts is providing a blueprint where we can say, hey, and I'm sure there's a lot of different um, criminal justice um, committees and everything that have all types of ideas, but if we could just be the, like the blueprint of, wow, you know, because not only do you have to talk the talk with Neon Arts, you gotta walk the walk. You gotta come up, you gotta come to these classes, you gotta come to these events. And um, when your probation officer sees you doing these things, it builds up a certain seniority, and that's the beginning, that's a baby step, because you gotta crawl before you walk. That's a baby step into the alternatives to incarceration. That's the main thing that I want us all to focus on. These are alternatives instead of just putting people in jail, locking them up, and then just throwing them back out into the system. That's what I want to say. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm Sarah Ogre, is the sound? Um, and I'm the executive director of Humanities New York, so we're not involved with NEON, but we are in, probably invited because we're heading down this path. I'm so inspired to be here. I wish I could see these hearings like before Congress and a few other things. Um, so I'll start by saying participation in a democracy requires placing, sometimes quite literally, your life in the hands of your fellow citizens. It requires robust civic trust, and it's hard to trust someone whose life and experience you do not know. Building on this insight, Humanities New York uses the tools of the humanities to foster engaged inquiry and dialogue around social and cultural concerns. One of our most direct engagements with the issues we're talking about here today began last March. We hosted a public conversation at Federal Hall just a few blocks away. The event was called After Attica, Criminal Justice and Mass Incarceration, and took historian Heather Ann Thompson's Pulitzer Prize winning book about the Attica uprising called Blood in the Water as a starting point for a discussion about the social and historical forces at work in the American penal system. Uh, we also had a, uh, Michael Weinrip on that from the New York Times and uh, Toussaint Lozier from Harvard University. Based on that event, we started to incorporate work on New York State prisons and our recently adopted strategic plan. It's a key area of focus. Uh, we have impaneled a committee led by board member Diva Woodley, associate professor of politics at the New York School University. Uh, in the meantime, we are, are a grant maker. I want you all to remember that. Uh, we are um, researching and planning, but also making some grants. I want to talk about three of them. Uh, we provided funding to the Incorrigibles, which is a Brooklyn-based theater project for bearing witness to the incarcerated girls of New York, a town hall at the Brooklyn Courthouse where experts, including formerly incarcerated women, professors, judges, and advocates, discuss the harm girls often endure during incarceration and what the future of justice for girls ought to look like. I'll mention just two quick ones. Stella Adler Studio for Acting uh, is running a project called Ritual for Return, uh, which is a program that addresses the way people are just dumped back into society without any marking or a graduation of some sort. So they designed their ritual together as an art project and a drama project. Columbia University's Heyman Center for the Humanities, Outside In, Art Museums at Rikers Island is another project that brings incarcerated youth, museum educators, and the general public to create art in a healing environment that ends with an art exhibit. Uh, we're also gonna cook up a reading group that uh, is based on our James Baldwin in America and Audre Lorde reading groups that any nonprofit can take, please take them. Um, so that is also in the written testimony. Thank you for everyone's patience. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Chair Powers mentioned before how great it was that Commissioner Bermudez was hanging around uh, a little bit longer. Um, I've, I've certainly seen lots of commissioners stay for portions of testimony. I don't know if I've ever seen a commissioner stay for the entire hearing. So, thank you. Uh, that's a first, and I've done this for nine years. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Uh, you know, I feel like we've become fast friends, um, Neon Arts and and myself, and um, uh, these last several weeks have really been uh, uh, very, very important for me as the chair of the Cultural Affairs Committee, uh, but also to me as like a human being. And so it's been really, really inspirational. And this is a uh, an important hearing, and you know, all of our 
days are incredibly busy uh, and we do a million things and every once in a while something stops you, right? It's almost like the power of art itself. It's why a theater performance is so great. It's why a visit to a museum and looking at art is important because it stops you for a second from the chaos of the world and it makes you think about why we're here and what we're supposed to be doing with this time on this earth, both of us as elected officials, but as people. This hearing is that moment, right? Is one of those moments where you're like, wherever I was coming from, rushing from that luncheon, wherever I'm going now, rushing to those evening events, this moment, these three hours, were really, really important. And mostly important because of all of the participants in the program who spoke and shared how it transformed your life and Khalif's life and um, all of the young people who have uh, since left, but they've all left their mark, right, in an incredible way. So uh, thank you, and we'll take all of this energy and, dare I say, love and move it into a way where we possibly can expand the program. So thank you so much. Thank you. I, I, thank you. I, I just want to follow up on, on some of the words that uh, Councilmember Van Bramer said. We should do more hearings together. This was a really fantastic one. Um, we have uh, often on my committee, we talk about the, I said this earlier, the challenges that we have in the city and the desperate need to make sure that the criminal justice system is in a much better place than it is today and where it has been in the past. Um, we don't do enough of shining a light or holding up those who we think are really doing their jobs and those that are help, impacting lives in a positive way. And probably as a body, we don't do that enough. Uh, but certainly, I know my committee, we don't do enough of talking about the good news and the stuff that is working in the city in ways that we can continue to invest in those. I think you've heard from that side of the table to this side of the table a lot of appreciation for the work that you were doing. But this, this, is in, this is, I think, one of the most important parts about this hearing is everybody who came up and talked about the way it affected their life because uh, that is the people that are being affected. And I will just leave with these parting words which I said earlier, which is that I have been here for a year. This is probably the best hearing I've had. It is also when we talked about how special of a place this is in City Hall. I'll never forget the first day I walked into this as a, as a council member and it made a commitment to do well for the city and for the people that live within it. I feel like we are here today collectively uh, sharing in that goal and it reminds me, so I think you, you maybe it was you who or somebody who mentioned that the importance of this place. It's not just the architecture, it's what we do inside of it, and I really do appreciate the opportunity to do this work every single day. I want to thank Councilmember Van Bramer. I want to thank all the members that participated in here and shared their own anecdotes and importance as well. And we don't get anywhere if it's not for the staff that helps put these hearings together, both our individual staffs. Give, please give them a big round of applause. And so uh, we'll see you, I guess, next month at the budget hearing, I think it is next month. I think we just had that today. Uh, so uh, thank you and thank you, everybody. And with that, that being said, uh, we are adjourned. Thanks. Thank you.